district, you know the Pope listens. Dynasty, our religion, for the blokes missing. On all of these trades, on all of these plays, on all of these grades. By the end of the day, y'all getting played. So, what you gonna do next? Try to fill up that flex? Send the homie a text? That trash offers the best? You try to make it complex? Then they text you back, now all of a sudden they don't make any sense? <laughs> Broaden your horizons, boy. Dynasty's not for the Simons, boy. These trades not for consignment, boy. Respect your opponent, y'all some piranhas, boy. This my advice from me to you. Open up your cute little podcast queue. Search up G-O-A-T District, my dude. Pop it in your ear, man. Y'all know what to do. It's the... And I always be traded. 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 And I always be traded. 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 And I always be trading. Y'all try to betray them, but first you gotta bait them. Bait them. Bait them. Fish. What is up, Fantasyland? We are back in the district. Hard not to get pumped to talk fantasy after the after Gabe rips it on the mic with the intro, with the anthem, the GOAT anthem. We thank everyone for tuning in, whether you're tuning in on podcasts, whether you're watching us on YouTube Live, on YouTube on replay, and now on Spotify. Guys, we're just we're just on the cutting edge here in the district, and we're here to give you the edge. And no better way. And to give you the edge at the tight end position, Theo, why don't you walk this man in proper? Because he deserves that. So this is the second time that we've had Andrew Cooper on the GOAT district. Last year we had him on um, right at the beginning of the regular se- regular season. Um, this year I think it's going to be even more impactful. Uh, Andrew is the Matt Harmon of, of tight ends. No, Almost no one in the industry does it like Andrew does. Um, every single year – he drops this incredible article that I retweeted and I'm sure we'll retweet after the show. Um, it's on fantasy alarm. It's called what makes an elite tight end. Um, and it's Can't handle the truth. And there's a few follow-up links with, 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 with some more articles that he's done, but he basically deep dives the tight end position um, extremely well. And I think he identifies what we're looking for league winners and guys who can make a significant impact at ADP. Um, Andrew, welcome back, and maybe you could talk about that article a little bit more. Man, thanks for having me, dude. Between the intro, the best intro, like, on the scene, man, by far. Like, it gets me fired up, dude. When when you see Mahomes smiling at the end of that, that was me, dude. I was like, yeah, let's go, let's get it. And then you got the applause, you got the goat sounds. Yeah, give, give me that, give me that, the, uh, you can't handle the truth playback again real quick if you got that. There. You can't that- handle the truth. <laughs> <laughs> that that gets me fired up, dude. Because you really can't. People really can't, though. Like I get, I get DMs sometimes. People are real upset about you know not even just tight ends. I'm on Ross St. Brown, like all this stuff. But you know what, dude? I I don't put anything out there that I don't truly believe, right? So this this series I do. It's a four part series. But the first article is the only thing you actually need to read if you're good at this game. And if you obviously if you're watching the Goat District, you know what you're doing, right? Like there's no amateurs watching this show right like this is these are these are diehard guys so if you just read the first article then you can set yourself up for success what this article does is it goes through all the historic data all the research i've done for years and years to get to this point where i am where people do trust me for tight ends and i just put it all in this one article and say here are the things that we want for upside for breakout tight ends for elite tight ends and if you just take those principles and apply it to your own projections, then you'll know who to go after. You'll stop betting against yourself, which is the biggest thing I see people doing. The the biggest example of that is one of the number one things is the vast majority of tight ends are top two targets on their team, right? The only exceptions that have finished top five in PPR are Robert Tunyon uh, during the COVID year when he had 11 touchdowns on like 59 targets. And then you have to go all the way back to Martellus Bennett. To find in 2014 on the Bears to find the next guy, right? So if you're sitting there saying your tight end is going to be the third target on his team, but you still like that guy, you're betting against yourself, right? So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about in this article. It's all it's all free up on Fantasy Alarm, and we go through a number of it. And I don't need to rehash the entire article right now because we're going to talk about each one of these points when we hit on different players here. So I'm not going to go through the whole article here, but like that's the kind of thing that I'm trying to say is that you don't even have to take my advice on the players. Everything in here is facts, right? So 
Let's get after it. Let's I'll, we can if you guys want, we can hit on every single tight end in the goddamn league, one after another. I got takes on all of them, all the way down to Michael Pruitt. So whatever you guys want to do, we're planning on it. So <laughs> why, why don't we? Why don't we? Why don't we just get it out of the way here? The guys Let's we do don't it. need to spend. We don't need to spend too much time on. How do you value Travis Kelsey this year? Are you taking him as a top six pick in a regular PPR league? And how should tight end premium drafters be valuing Kelsey? Yeah, this is one of the biggest ones I get where people are like, oh, you're the tight end guy. You must love Kelsey. Obviously, I do love Kelsey, but I don't love drafting these guys. And here's why. In a normal league that's a non-tight end premium league, a, a tight end has never been the number one flex player. So every, pretty much every league nowadays has a flex, right? The number one flex player, it's sometimes a wide receiver, you know, Cooper Cup, Antonio Brown. It's obviously sometimes a running back, but it's never been a tight end. So I obviously I understand positional scarcity. Because I'm the tight end guy. I preach that. It keeps me in business. But I want, with my first pick, or even my first two picks, guys that I truly believe can be the number one flex player, so I'm not often taking a tight end. So Travis Kelsey goes before I can usually take him. And this year, Mark Andrews also goes before I can take him. The thing with Mark Andrews is, last year, I believe he probably had the best year he's ever going to have. And that's because Greg Roman's a guy that doesn't typically throw the ball uh, he, if you go through his entire career, he's bottom four in pass attempts every single year, going all the way back to San Francisco, except last year where he was, you know, ninth, right? Even if they fall back to 15 or 20th, that's going to bring Mark Andrews kind of out of that range where he was. So you pull up this draft board that we're all looking at now. Anyone that's just listening and can't see it, Mark Andrews is going as a second pick of the second round. For me, I'm not taking him there because I believe that CD Lamb could be the number one flex player. Joe Mixon, these guys are all going after him. So I, I, just, I, can't ta- I can't rightfully take Mark Andrews before those guys. So I, I don't think those guys are going to be bad. I have them as my top two tight ends. I just, I'm not taking them at ADP. I don't know. What do you guys think? Are you guys on board with those two players? or you know, Because they're, they're super safe. They are really safe. Well, yeah, I, I, I can, I'm sorry. You take this one, Dan. Sorry about that. Okay. So, yeah, just to start with, I'll throw it over to you, Theo. I, I think um, you know that, that Andrews really onto something there. Um, because of the fact, I mean, now this is tight end premium, you know, FFPC, uh, so you can start up to three tight ends, but as he said, um, uh, typically there's somebody better you can throw in your flex. And, um, uh, if you get comfortable with the, the tight end position, you get comfortable with the, the concepts that, that Coop's got going here. Uh, you know, you feel a lot more comfortable just waiting on tight end and you feel like you can, uh, you can mine that diamond in the rough because every year there's two or three diamonds in the rough that are just, you know, waiting there to be unearthed. And, uh, you know, maybe you'll do it in your draft. Maybe you'll do it the first week or two of free agency. Uh, but if, if you take that elite tight end, you kind of take yourself out of that market and you, you leave it open for somebody else. And that makes it more likely that that other person who got the super cheap, but super productive tight end is going to do better than you in some way in the week. Uh, so, in terms of like Kelsey and Andrews, I've kind of taken them when, when they've fallen, um, like in our, in our hard way football guys, um, this very difficult, uh, football guys uh, league that I do with Dan. Um, I had Kelsey and he went a little later. I was able to get him. Andrews was actually the first tight end off the board in that, in that league. So Kelsey got pushed back a little bit. I was able to get him. Um, and I've taken Mandrews when he's been an early second round pick. I think I I took him with a, um, you know, right around where he's on the board JD listed. So, yeah, I'm not looking to – they're not like the foundational pieces of my my build, but I'm I'm a high-volume guy. I don't want to get shut out at those guys. But I I tend to to lean with Dan. I think you kind of lose your edge um, when you take one of those guys and and you really, really push them up your board. Um, But I'm not like I'm not opposed to it when I get them at a value. Yeah, I'm I'm like eight percent or less on uh, on the top three guys. I like Pitts obviously in Dynasty. I don't mind taking him in the, in the you know first or second round in tight end premiums. But redraft best ball. Um, I like my builds when I wait a bit. If the, if these guys fall, like if Kelsey Kelsey, if I'm I'm in the mid to to late uh, first round in a tight end premiums like the FFPC, I'm considering him for some builds just to get those builds mixed in there. Pitts, I like that he still has upside there. I find Andrews, you're kind of grabbing him at his ceiling, uh, in my opinion. 
I, I like Kittle because he's been falling, and I find I still have him in that top tier. So I like what Kittle offers. I don't like Schultz because he's come up the ADP board big time. Uh, so I, I don't mind throwing in some builds with these guys. But like Theo and Dan said, I, there's so much value later on, and you can build so many nice rosters piling in the receivers and running backs early um, that, yeah, I, I don't have maybe, – maybe I don't have enough of those guys, but I, I'm under 10% right now. I have yeah, a follow-up you're... question uh, for, for Coop. You mentioned Mark Andrews like with Roman last year. Do you – and just to put on our dynasty caps for a minute, and I also want to hear J.D. and Dan's because we haven't really discussed this. Do we think that this is maybe the, the proper time to sell Mark Andrews in dynasty? Has he hit his absolute I, dynasty I peak? I am. Ah, yeah, so he is at his peak. The thing is, though, if you're a competing team right now, the number of tight ends that are – really difference makers is so thin that if you're competing, you almost can't sell him unless you have somebody else, right? Cause you, you want to, you need to fill dynasty. So top heavy, right? Like the good teams are so good and the bad teams are so bad that you need that top dog, right? So unless you have somebody that you truly believe in, I'm not a big fan of cashing out just for value. Now, if you are a team that is not really competing, tre- Kelsey, you definitely got to sell and, and Andrews, I'm willing to sell just because I do think they're at peak value. But my general philosophy, and I know this is this is a big dynasty podcast. My general philosophy on tight end is this: roster talent, start opportunity. And the big problem with dynasty is that you're going to have guys that are talented that are not in a position to be a top two target on their team. The biggest example is a guy like Delaney Walker. He sat behind Vernon Davis for seven years before he got moved to the Titans. And then he was the top guy and a top two target on the team. And he was the top five tight end for three straight years, all over the age 30. Dallas Goddard, another great example where, you know, he's stuck behind Ertz. It's forcing him in line. It's it's unique compared to wide receiver because wide receiver talent's all that matters. There's three guys on the field. The most talent guys are, talented guys are going to get the ball. With tight end, it's this whole mess of guys needing to block and guys needing to, you know, having, you know, teams trading for A.J. Brown and trading for Tyreek Hill. And now it just moves you down the pecking order. It's, it's such a mess that, you know, when you do have that unique combination of talent and opportunity that you get with Andrews or Kelsey and Dynasty, you kind of just have to hold on to it for dear life. Dan, how much to get a Mark Andrews share off you? <laughs> in, in Dynasty, you're not going to get like Coop said, you're not going to do it unless I'm I'm totally uh, trying to retool the team uh, because what if I know, offered it, you Kid George Kittle plus? Like you I, that's, cash that's out that exactly way. what I'm looking for. That's what I'm talking about. That's where you can add some value, right? Yeah, right. that's so. That's the kind of move where you can you can if you if you can trick them into thinking last year is the norm for for Mark Andrews. That's that's how you make the play. Good call, JD, on that. That that's the that's the swap, right? Right. Yeah. You got to, you've got to do something like that because the difference between dynasty and redraft is we do, you know, we don't really care as much uh, about what we paid for them in dynasty. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're trying to win this year, uh, then really all that matters is, is how many points can you cram in your lineup? And, you know, to me, it doesn't matter if Mark Andrews had his peak year last year, he's still going to be, you know, a top five tight end probably at worst this year. So, uh, you know, he's, he's still, one of the best options you can possibly put in your lineup. So you don't want to trade that away if you're, if you're going for a title, you, you gotta, you gotta do what we call the pivot, right? Like you, yeah. you gotta, you gotta get, you gotta get what you think can either match or, or get something close to, to the, to that production. Like you're talking about uh coop, but still gain value on top. If you can, I'm not talking about giving away a piece like that. Cause you guys know, tight end preems, these, these bulldogs, like these, these guys, win you leagues, I mean, if you don't have them, the guys that do have them are probably beating you week to week. Yeah, tight end premium is a different beast because these guys can be the number one flex player. Travis Kelsey was the number one guy in Scott Fishbowl. And I'll even throw in a real quick, if we're going to hit on every single foreman on this show, might as well get crazy, right, boys? Like, best, my best ball, here's my best ball take, right? You know, we got to love stacking. If you take Kelsey or Mark Andrews at the end of the swing there, 11-12, you are pretty much... I mean, you got to go for the stack, right? Now, all of a sudden, you need to kind of reach for Lamar Jackson or Mahomes just because they both have ADP of 50, right? So you look at that swing there. So you go 11, 12. Those picks at the end of the 12th there are 37 and 38. 
So it's like you're not getting him. I guess actually we'll get Lamar Jackson there. So that's that's a butte that you just pulled up where you get Lamar Jackson in the next round, but you got Jackson at a discount. So sometimes when you make those, once you make that commitment, you're kind of making a double commitment to reach for the quarterback too. So just keep that in mind. I I, I really should mix a couple of those in just to have them, but uh, you know, it, it is a commitment. The, the problem is it's like my deodorant example. I got Andrews for so cheap go, going into last year and then he popped, you know what I mean? So now it's like, uh, it's kind of like Debo. Like I see Debo there in the second round. I just can't, it's, I just can't do it. You know, I'm like looking at everyone else cause I just can't pay that price now. Mm-hmm. He's over Debo is over under. If you look at his over under yards, it's only like nine twenty five. I'm a little, I mean, obviously the rushing and stuff is in there, but I don't know, man. It's a little scary with the new quarterback. Oh, it's a tight end show, though. Nineteen twelve. You know, so, we will, my boy Alberto. We will definitely. Oh, we're, we're, we will. We will hit on that. JD's JD's oh, revving up for for the Alberto <laughs> questions, and he's even more excited for the Robert Tunyon questions later on. But if we got to get. We got to. We got to hit a big ticket tight end. Um, speaking of dynasty, I was I was rebuffed in my offer of Mark Andrews and David Montgomery for Kyle Pitts because I'm so big on Kyle Pitts in dynasty right now. It's not even funny, and I'm into him in redraft. I took him at. 36 overall recently in an NFFC. That's just a regular old PPR league. Um, and, but you're seeing in, in FFPC, he occasionally touches the one-two turn, and he's a lock to go in the second round every draft. He never falls lower than the 212, the 212 and that's very rare. Um, I would say that you're looking at him. JD's shown you about mid-second. I think it's somewhere between 12 and 18 for, for, the, for the rest of the summer. How high are you on Kyle Pitts? Do you think he could have like 135 targets and have just an absolute smash season? Or do you think he's getting overdrafted? No, I'm so of these top five guys, anybody that checks out that article, we'll see kind of, I have my rankings in there and also whether I like guys or not ADP, because that's the real important thing here. Kyle Pitts is one of the only, these top five guys that I'm taking at or around ADP. Everybody else I'll only take if they slide just honestly, And this is my best advice for anybody across the board in fantasy. Lean into what you're good at. Like, I truly believe that I do enough research that I can generate value at the position later. If you're the kind of guy that loves finding late round wide receivers, don't draft a bunch of wide receivers early. Lean into what you are good at, right? Like JJ Zacharyson, his tag is late round QB. Like, that's how he made his money. You know, zero RB guys. To be a zero RB guy, you know all the zero RB targets. So lean into what you're good at. So for me, I usually don't take the top guys. That being said, Kyle Pitts checks so many of the boxes in that first article, the one you guys linked, that you you almost have to take him. He, uh, right, he's a top two target on the team. We know that he could be the top target, which there's very few guys even that even have that in the range of outcomes. He blocks on well under. So the the bar is 15% of your pass plays. If you block on more than 15% of your pass plays, it's damn near impossible to be a top five tight end. There's been so few examples. One of them is George Kittle, just over 15 in 2019. Before that, you have to go back to like Julius Thomas on the Broncos. Uh, Rob Gronkowski at one point did it, but like very few examples. Pitts blocks on something like 3% of his pass plays. He plays wide receiver. Another one, playing wide receiver. 70% of his pass snaps are at wide receiver. These are all huge. The things that he isn't good at or that the boxes he doesn't check are uh, he's not great versus man to man. And that is very important in the red zone because it's all zero coverage down there. Right. So like this guy, you need to be able to get lined up against the quarterback and beat that guy and score a touchdown. Like that is that's why Mark Andrews is so good. That's why Hunter Henry is such a good uh, guy in that area. Kyle Pitts is not good at that. He, he had a very low catch rate on those. He only caught one of six end zone targets. That's where he needs to improve. But if he does improve in that, he could very easily be, honestly, one of the best receiving tight ends of all time. I mean, what Mike Dicka is the only other guy to have 1,000 yards as a rookie. Like he, It's in his range of outcomes. This guy is basically, I mean, the range of outcomes for this guy is, is Megatron that you can start a tight end. Is it not? Like That's, that's the guy we're looking at. Obviously, people are scared of the coach and the quarterback, but I look at, you know, a guy I mentioned earlier, Delaney Walker, with this same coach and this same quarterback, Arthur Smith, Marcus Mariota, that those were the guys when he was top five, three years in a row. So for me, Kyle Pitts, I'm willing to take him at the right value at ADP. And I use Mark Andrews as a shield. When a Mark Andrews goes, I start thinking maybe I'll take Kyle Pitts. And then when Kyle Pitts goes, I'm just like, all right, I'm gonna wait on tight end. So that's my take on that guy. Sorry, I took up so much time there, but I got no. That's 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 awesome. I'm glad to hear you're so bullish, and you know, 
Bitcoin is heading to absurd levels uh, this season. How many Bitcoin? How many Bitcoins do you have right now, Dan? Um, I've got a couple. Um, I have not done too much early tight end drafting. Um, you know, like like I was saying earlier, I kind of trust myself to to grab the later options. So I tend to do that a little bit more. Um, exceptions are when I'm in a tournament and I can do a stack. Like uh, I was showing Theo a, a attorney build I was doing in the Superflex tourney. Uh, you know, so I, I took uh, Lamar Jackson and then I took Mark Andrews coming back in the second round because it's also a tight end premium. So, uh, you know, something like that works out really well. And that was kind of my plan going in. But other, other than that, um, I won't have too much Kelsey, not too much Pitts, not too much Andrews. Waller, definitely not too much of other than Dynasty. I've got quite a bit of uh, Waller here still. And then Kittle, I, I actually do like him uh, when he drops into the the fourth round and tight end premium or only drops to like the late fifth and uh in regular just normal ppr can i ask you guys a quick question because yeah. i, I want to get i want to get your sentiment on it i feel like it's split down the middle so p- p- i find that people have two uh, two sentiments on drafting both early tight end and early quarterback some people feel great about it makes them feel comfortable and then some people feel kind of dirty about it so like jd with you, like when you take a tight end, you take a tight end or quarterback early. How does it like? How do you feel about that build when you're looking at it? Yeah, to be honest, I I always like to mix my builds. Like I really like to mix builds, just because you know we draft so much. I just if we are always kind of drafting the same, and I I don't mind them. I just I feel like that's kind of I always say like there's an art to building these rosters and looking at these draft boards. And as long as you know how to balance out your your draft you know, and you're not taking early tight ends, early quarterbacks, you know, your second quarterback early, your second tight end, like you're just, you know, giving yourself such a, um, a disadvantage at, at more than a position. I mean, you should be fine. You should be able to balance out that roster. And I think, you know, what you're hearing from the guys on the screen and at Theo and, and Dan, I know Theo probably uh, uh, drafts even more than I do. He sees a lot more boards and you know you, you want to mix it. You want to mix it up, right? Right, Theo. You want to kind of mix it up and, and do the different builds, um, so that you're not kind of put into a corner. But I don't know that there's ever a build where you're where you can't balance it out nicely, and then you finish that 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 draft, and you're like, you know what? I I, I figured it out. You know, I I managed to kind of catch up at whatever position it is that I went early. I get your question. I don't know if I am if I'm answering your question. No, you are. You are because you're you're comfortable with it. I mean, there are people that they, they do it. I've heard a million times where they do it. And then at the end, they're just like, I just don't feel right about it. But I, it's like, I feel like maybe it's a stigma you've got to get beyond Theo. What do you think? So I don't like having a dogmatic rules as a drafter. And I think a lot of times Twitter, you see these people saying X, Y, Z strategy is stupid. And this is, it's the worst. Pick the right, pick the, pick the correct players and any strategy works. But I will add that in a 20, in a 20 man format, like FFPC, NFFC, FFWC, you are at a disadvantage if you take a QB and a tight end in the first six rounds, unless you nail the nuts. Yeah, yeah. it's it can happen where it's where you hit the nuts and you get Mahomes and Kelsey and it's great. But there was a few years ago, and Dan, you'll remember this, where it was a universal law that if you got the one hundred one, you took Christian McCaffrey and you followed up with Mark Andrews and Lamar Jackson at the at the uh, the two three turn. There was more teams doing that than in, than anyone in the contest, and it, and it came came back to bite them in the butt. The same thing happens in these other other contests like NFFC, where it's a six point passing touchdown format. And quarterbacks sometimes get pushed up. If I take quarterback and I take and I take tight end in the same NFFC draft in like the first five rounds, then I'm absolutely playing catch up, and it's usually at wide receiver, and that that's going to hurt me. So I don't want to be dogmatic. Um, maybe this is the year where you can take both in the first six rounds, but I'm absolutely not scared to go early tight end. I'm absolutely not scared to take, you know, the first QB or the second QB off the board if they fall to a reasonable level. But I do usually avoid drafting both in the first, you know, six or so rounds. How about you, Dan? Well, if yeah, if you guys remember when we were drafting the the pros versus Joes, what was what was kind of the first thing we said was we're not drafting both an elite quarterback and an elite tight end. Yeah, and 
But and best then, ball, best ball, you can you can make up for it, right, more. Right. Yeah, you can make up for it a little bit more. But um, you know, but also we kept, we said, you know, this is probably going to be a bad idea. Then we came around and we actually did it anyway because <laughs> <laughs> of the way the draft was falling. It was like, but we knew we were putting ourselves in a hole at wide receiver, so we knew that was where we we're going to have to make up the the value in the uh, later on rounds. So, you know, as as long as you understand uh, what you're leaving yourself open to when you do something like that, you know, that you're going to have one position where you're going to really have to, you're going to have to get a little bit lucky and you're also going to have to throw a, you know, a few more picks at it uh, in the later rounds. If you can do those things, then that's great. But if that's not something you're comfortable with, then you probably shouldn't draft both quarterback and tight end early, pick one or the other and just go from there. And I'll add for any any casual games that gamers out there too. The flip side definitely goes for these shallow hometown leagues. Like I've seen leagues that are legit, like eight or ten people, and it's one QB, two running backs, two wide receivers, a tight end, oh, and yeah. flex. But you and, in those in those leagues, you want to go stud at every position as much as yeah, you, right? Exactly. And That's why it's the man, flip. Yeah, ten man, one hundred percent. Eight yeah. man, one hundred percent. And and you need to have that top tight end and quarterback to even and, have a shot because everybody's starting a wide receiver too at, at the worst. Exactly. And it's a huge percentage of your, if you really think about the scoring itself, it's a bigger percentage of your lineup, right? Like at the Scott Fishbowl, you start 11 dudes in that format. You're starting five, right? Right. Five or six or whatever it is. True. So, True. you know, it's, it's such a big percentage of, of your lineup and there's, you know, like there's wide receivers and running backs lying all over the ground. And just to, just to piggyback on Dan, what was saying just roster construction wise, I think as long as you're not sacrificing, like as long as you're not adding depth, to the position that you're going early and taking away depth at the other positions that are like in order to balance out, you know what I mean? Because you're sacrificing those positions early to take whether it's a quarterback or the, the tight end. You, you, if you use the depth at the other positions to balance it out, you should be good, you know, and that's where the roster construction, the art of it, you know, kind of kicks in. Mm -hmm. Yep. For sure. We see, we see two guys who are former first round picks in FFPC and, for, and um, have certainly lost um, some redraft value a year later. I'm going to link them together in a question. What's your approach to Darren Waller and George Kittle? Do you view them as impactful, potentially elite tight ends that you want a piece of, or do you have any apprehension on drafting those two guys? So my philosophy on them is simple. And the, it's kind of the way it's been going with drafts is I have to sit there and say, why is this guy still here? For me to take one of these guys like i have to sit there and have one of waller or kittle fall enough that i'm like i gotta take him here because i i'm just not as high on them as i've been in the past like think about darren waller uh you know that team has never really had serious target competition for him right they've tried to get antonio brown he froze his feet off and called the gm a cracker and you know brought a spray painted helmet to practice like got himself kicked off the team. Henry Ruggs is in jail. Like they tried to bring guys in. It never worked. That's why this guy was getting 18, 20 targets at times. And that's why we loved him. But now with Devontae Adams and Hunter Renfro, I don't really see a need for them to throw 17 targets to Darren Waller. I still think he's going to be a solid tight end. I think he's going to finish within the top five or six or so. It's just, I don't like paying up for that when I think I can get it elsewhere. And same with George Kittle is that conditions have changed for George Kittle as well. Debo is good. Ayuk's good. The quarterback Honestly, it's probably not going to be as good of a passer as Jimmy Garoppolo. That's what we need to to kind of figure out here is that Jalen, like you can be a better quarterback without being a better passer. I mean, Gardner Minshew might be a better passer than Jalen Hurts. I'm not saying he is, but I mean, he threw two touchdowns to Dallas Goddard and Jalen Hurts wasn't really doing that. You know what I mean? So it's these are the things you got to think about. And for me, it's enough risk that I'm not going to pay up. I just like other guys later. Uh, I don't know about you guys. It's, it's one of those things where, like I said, if they fall and I'm sitting there and I'm like, all right, someone's got to take Darren Waller, then I'll take him. But I'm just not taking him while running backs and wide receivers I like are there. And that list is probably a little too long this year. for me. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, you know, it's I, I think with Kittle, um, He's he's got such a such an efficiency, um, you know, like so much extra efficiency over so many of the other tight ends. I mean, you know, the the number of uh, and and Coop, you go into this in your articles, but the the number of you know just super long uh, plays or touchdown plays that he has he has gotten, as well as you know just the fact that he's he's up there on so much less volume than uh, 
some of the other tight ends because he's doing more blocking. And, uh, you know, so he's just getting, he's getting out into routes less often than a lot of the other elite tight ends, but he's still getting out there. And when he gets a target, he does the maximum with it. So, you know, that, that's what kind of makes him still worthwhile to me, but I do agree that, um, with IU Debo and then, uh, the downgrade grade at quarterback, or at least we have to assume it's a downgrade right now. Uh, it makes him a risky proposition for sure. It's insane the stats on on Kittle. Like no one's even close in right. terms of forty plus yard target, forty plus yard plays. Like he's just the master at it. In two thousand eighteen, like think about this: there's not another tight end that has had multiple. There's not another tight end within the last five years that's had two plays over seventy yards. In two thousand eighteen, Kittle had three, and two of them were eighty yard plays. Like he's just ridiculous. It's the combination of the offense and his speed, which he's still at four five. It's like ninety six percentile speed, and it's going to be even crazier with Jalen Hurts. I'm sorry, with Trey Lance, like the the play action stuff. Like he's definitely going to rip off some big ones, which makes him a little more interesting in best ball. It's just it's hard for me to to pay up when I just I I've got this other strategy going. So right, exactly, and that and that's the thing is he's probably going to be a little bit less uh, consistent week to week, but you know. You, you'll still get the giant weeks from him. And, uh, you know, and, and the thing is with Kittle, I mean, you know, anytime I see a player getting boosted because of efficiency based on one year, uh, I get real nervous about that. But with some, with somebody like Kittle, who's done it over and over, eventually you have to chalk it up to skill rather than just, you know, dumb luck, uh, you know, because so many, so many players bounce around enough in efficiency that you can just, you know, they have a great year and you can just say, well, that was dumb luck and uh, we should plan on regression. With Kittle, you just, you can't really do that. You just say, well, that's Kittle being Kittle and, uh, you know, you factor it in and, and that's part of what you got to consider. I, I love that he has the discount. I love that people, you know, are, are factoring in that he's a blocker. I mean, he's been a top, pretty much a top three tight end last year's top four points per game every year. Uh, you know, since his rookie season, whether he's blocking, catch it, the guy's a beast, man. You know what I mean? And that that's exactly the type of guy that'll win you a league because he can easily be, be the tight end one and he's going as a tight end five right now, you know, and he's falling a lot in these drafts and I hope he keeps falling, man. I, lo- I love seeing him. I love these guys falling. Waller, I'm with you guys. I love uh, what you said, Coop, because, you know, you 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 like to, to have people agree with you and he's just been someone I've been avoiding, Waller, and I even have him in some FFPC dyno where I've been trying to move them, you know, and, and do that pivot. Cause I find him and, and Mandrews are kind of the guys where I think this might be the last year that their values are this high, top five ish, top three ish, and you can get that value back. Um, I don't know that they'll be there going into next year. So I, I drafted, well, I had a, I did two early main events um, and I drafted Waller once at the three ten, which for FFPC is slightly below ADP. Um, and I think that the one thing that the drafting a Waller there uh, kind of did for me is it allows me to hit other positions because, like Coop said, he's not extremely high on him, but we all think he's going to be a top five tight end, um, and I, th- I I think that's a that's a fair bet. And I think that the that not being next being being uh, you know having a lack of of pass catching uh, options around him previously. I think you could also take the flip side argument that now the pie is going to grow larger. There's a yeah. chance that Las Vegas has a really, really good offense. Um, and now you have Waller next to Renfro, next to Adams. As long as Renfro doesn't really, really leapfrog him in terms of target share by that, that much, he can, he can have a higher target share, but it can't be by that, that much. Then I think Waller is going to, is going to pay off um, fine at his ADP. He might not be a league winner, but I don't think he's going to hurt you when you get him at the, you know, close to the end of the third round in an FFPC. And then Kittle, I drafted him the other night with, um, with the best ball that uh, JD and I competed against. And then uh, the, the pros versus Joes that, that Dan split with JD and I, um, I, we drafted Kittle and I was really happy to do so. I love him in best ball because you don't have to worry about the, you don't have to worry about the games missed because you have depth at the tight end um, and the spike weeks are, are, are exciting. I just I'm not against drafting him in the mid fourth of FFPC. Um, I it just hasn't happened for me yet, um, and I haven't drafted him in in other formats as well. So I agree with uh, JD. I would like to get some Kittle, but I, again, it just hasn't happened for me. 
Uh, Theo, before we move on to, uh, we have a question in the chat. Shout out to the chat, 1912, rocking it as usual. Our, our boy Shelly can be up with us tonight. He's he's rocking a La Quinta tonight somewhere on the shore, the West Coast somewhere. Uh, but he had a question. Uh, another man that loves to draft in the high stakes streets. He's wondering if you're if you can draft a one tight end roster. Are there any tight ends that you would use in such a build? And where where's the cutoff for those? You know that tight end. I guess you could say. Yeah, so obviously man, in a twenty man coop, just to say if it's a, are you, is there any tight end you're taking and set and forget it, it? Even in a twenty man, or even in, even in a regular redraft, I'm I'm willing to take uh, any of these guys here. I mean, because it's like you know, best ball you need multiple. But if you have waivers and stuff, if I take if I commit the capital needed to take Kelsey Andrews, Pitts, Waller, or Kittle, any of those top five, I've already made my bed. That's my opinion, is that I've invested the capital. I'm only worrying about bye weeks. Now, I will put a little caveat on that, that if I draft Darren Waller and there's deep enough rosters, deep enough bench spots, I'll take a second tight end that I feel really good about. I have a big list of them. And here's why. He has the earliest bye week of any tight end, week six, and it's the same bye week as TJ Hawkinson. So if you have deep enough uh, rosters and deep enough bench spots, not only are you going to need somebody fairly early, but you're going to be competing with somebody else who's probably just drafting one tight end as well. So with Darren Waller, I will, if with enough bench spots, I mean, you got to start thinking about it. It's a good little tip for week six. FPC streets. Yeah, week six. So week six, if you draft Waller or Hawkinson, just know there's another guy in your league that's going to be side-eyeing whatever tight ends on waivers if you both only draft one. So in that position, I'm willing to use a bench spot just to see, you know, and if on a on a always as a on a high risk, high reward guy. So if the guy isn't good, I'm still willing to drop him, but I'm gonna probably drop him looking for the the tight end and I'm gonna start week six. So they just the little something schedule wise, it's not that often that you get you know, there's so few elite tight ends. It's not that often that the two of them are the first bye week because that's going to be, you know, somebody else is going to be going to be looking at that too. It's a good point. Nin- 1912 is asking, and I, and I dropped this question in, in our uh, DM, like with the guys, uh, you know, when we were talking about tonight's show, because I was I, I wanted to ask that exact question. I don't know if it's been talked about and I just missed it, but is there a tight end dead zone? You know, we talk about the running back dead zone. Is there a tight end dead zone? I feel like after this Schultz, Goddard, you know, maybe it's after Hawkinson and then there's kind of like a lull, you know, until you get to like Albert O. What do you, what do you feel about the the tight end dead zone? Dude, not only is there a tight end dead zone, it's the, it's the same tight end dead zone every year. It's the same one every year. And it's basically the, it's, it's dudes that, that were, that produced last year, usually because of injury and became top two targets on their team. And now everybody is thinking they're going to re, they're going to recreate that production despite changes, right? A lot of times despite changes, like think about Dallas Goddard. Like, what are we doing with Dallas Goddard was a top two target on the team last year. You got bailed out picking Dallas Goddard in general because an angel came down and saved you and picked up Zach Ertz and moved him to a different bird team on the other side of the country, right? So first of all, you got bailed out just in general with that situation for him to get where he was. And then Gardner Minshew had to come in and throw him two touchdowns. And then this year, they go out and they trade for AJ Brown. And they still have Devonta Smith who got more targets than Dallas Goddard. What are you doing with Dallas Goddard? And it's the same thing with a lot of these guys, Mike Gusecki, right? Like we, we talk about needing to be a top two target on the team, unless they're going to be Robert Tunyon, right? I don't rank Mike Gusecki ahead of, of uh, Jalen Waddle and Tyreek Hill in targets, right? And, you know, JD doesn't and Theo doesn't and Dan does it. So what are we doing drafting this guy? You know what I mean? So I feel like this whole group here is kind of brutal in terms of that. Uh, one guy that I am taking out of this group as part of my tight end pairing system is I will take, I'll take, I'll take, there's three guys out of this group really that I'll take. If you want me to just get into that or, or do yeah, you guys want yeah. to talk about is the it, dead zone? Sure. Yeah. Sure, right go. yeah like, cause I mean, we've, we just talked about the three tight ends for a half hour. So might as well throw a little fast forward on there for, for these guys. Right. <laughs> I mean, I telling you, man, you let me go on these. It's a dangerous game. Dude. We might have to make this like a six part series, nice. but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll go quick though. I'll go quick. And here's what I'm doing. <laughs> here's what I'm doing. Right. If I, so I just said the guys I'm willing to draft just the one. If I'm already out of that zone. So I'm drafting two, I'm drafting the safest guy possible. 
and then I'm drafting the riskiest, highest upside guy possible as a bench spot. And I don't care about the floor at all with the second guy. The first guy, I, I need to start them early in my season, and you can't bleed losses. We're talking regular redraft here, right? So for me, I look at TJ Hawkinson with Jamison Williams uh, missing the early season, Dalton Schultz with Michael Gallup missing the early season, and Zach Ertz with DeAndre Hopkins missing the early, early season. These guys are fairly safe, albeit a bit boring, that you can put in your lineup week one and feel good about it. So those guys from that group, if I wait on tight end, I just try and get a good value on one of those guys and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to start these guys. Worst case scenario, I start them all year. Best case scenario, I find this year's breakout with my second tight end spot. You know, I, I draft a second one. Like with Mark, you know, every single year for the last five years, there's been a tight end that has come from outside the top 17 in ADP to deliver for us, right? To be a top five tight end. We're talking Dalton Schultz was tight end like 30, uh, you know, before that, you had Logan Thomas was well. He wasn't even being drafted. He was tight end three at the end of the year. Uh, Darren Waller and Mark Andrews. Before that, Eric Ebron scored 13 touchdowns. He was not being drafted in the top 17. And then before that, uh, Evan Ingram is a rookie. Like these guys are out there, so you got to give yourself a shot. So that's my strategy for the middle. Is I'll draft one of those three, uh, and then you know we'll get into the second group here. But those three guys from the dead zone, I'm willing to take the other ones, I, unless I can personally say they're going to be top two on the team in targets. I can't do it. Now I want to hear what you guys have to say about a couple of these guys. Uh, you know, whether you're interested in, you know, sp- specifically, I want to hear about Pat Fryermuth. Do you guys like him or do you not? Because he's a, such a tough one for me. He's a tough one for everybody. I think. So Fr- Fryermuth was a, was a goat district favorite last year. We all made money with Fryermuth. Um, and we all have, have a lot of them in dynasty. Um, I have, I have a ton of Fryermuth. I think that the we can't completely ignore Fryermuth, despite questions about the Steelers' offense, uh, and despite the fact that he's going kind of high up in the in what we're calling the dead zone. Um, I think that he he was showed elite touchdown upside, um, where he was just an absolute mauler. He had, I think he was sixth in the NFL in touchdowns scored as a rookie, and I think that if you look at his season and just just look at his points scored. It doesn't even do it justice because if you if you look at his basically his points from like week seven on when he started being a big part of the of the Steelers attack, um, he was he was way up there. So he finishes tight end 13 as a rookie, which is historically very high. Um, and again, he, he had really, really flashed to end the season. So I think if you have huge reservations about the Steelers offense as a whole, you can make arbi- uh, an arbitrage type play and, and bet on Friar. That being said, I haven't drafted him that often, um, but I, I, I'm not like I'm not putting him on, on like a do not draft list. So I think he's a very talented player, um, and I think that like his stats don't do him complete justice from last year. Yeah, I, I, I like the player. I hate the situation this year. Just can't get myself behind it at all. Um, you know, it, he was such a great fit for the Roethlisberger and the types of uh, throws Roethlisberger liked to make. And, you know, this year, you know, who are we looking at? We're looking at Trubisky or Pickett. You know, I don't know enough about Pickett to say one way or another, but if it's Trubisky, uh, you know, I, I just don't know that Friermuth really fits what he does as a passer very well. So, I don't know. What do you, what do you think, Coop? I think you just hit the nail on the head there. That, that's what really scares me is that people think that these guys are going to come in and just be better than Big Ben, and they might be. But Big Ben was actually great for Pat Frymuth. Like when you look at the numbers, the passer rating from Big Ben to Frymuth was 121.6. Like, like I don't think anybody on the team is going to have 120 passer rating to any players on the team this year. You know what I mean? Like it's just it's probably not going to happen. And you know the same thing with the uh, if you go player profiler, which is a site I really like. Uh, the catchable targets third. His catchable target rate in the league was third coming from Big Ben. So Big Ben and Big Ben had the number one fastest time to release, 2.26 seconds, faster than Tom Brady. And I, I love Tom Brady. He's the he's the GOAT. But nobody gets away with intentional grounding on purpose more than that dude. And it's like he's perennially having the lowest number, and Big Ben was faster last year. So, like, I just – I don't necessarily love it or trust it. I love him in Dynasty, though. And you, you guys had him on the show? You guys were on the mute? 
Oh. Big time on the move. Yeah. Last year. Yeah, let's go. I mean, because that's the thing. He's the perfect guy for the mantra, right? Yep. Dra- roster talent, start opportunity. So if you have Pat Frymuth, don't trade him unless you're going all in trying to win this year, right? You hold on to him and you wait for that window to open. We know that Chase Claypool is super weird, right? There's no question about it. I don't think that they want, right? Like, I mean, I'm not out of line to say that, right? The things he's no. been saying and and the way they've even been treating him. Hold on, time out, Coop. You can't insult a Canadian with oh, he's just because right here. Canadian, just because just because he puts a little more maple syrup on his pancakes, man. <laughs> I don't oh, think he's not weird because he's kind of anti-Canadian bias. No, this is not against maple. There's no nothing against Maple Tron for because of where he's from. I'm talking about the way that he's taught, like saying he's a top three wide receiver and kind of just he's putting himself on the outs with a coach that is. Mike Tomlin, you know, he's a player's coach to a certain degree, but he is a no nonsense dude as well. Right. So like, I don't, I just think that Claypool feels like a guy that's not earning himself an extension right now. And I think that that's when, that's when the, uh, when the, the mooth really gets loose is when he has a real opportunity to be a top two target. But right now it's probably a little too cluttered. I mean, he's so young. That's the thing is that like crazy. I mean, Travis Kelsey didn't have his first thousand yard season until he was 27. It's like, there's, uh, tight end that's just the way it goes and also our boys hunter henry and evan ingram both 27 right now something to mm-hmm. think about yeah and, that, I, and the thing is with fryer with too i mean he's a he's a guy who kind of i have a kind of a pin in on uh my dynasty weeks to go out and inquire you know four five six weeks into the season if he hasn't done much and you know just see if somebody's willing to you know to let him go in a deal for a little bit cheaper because they're starting to get discouraged about oh, you, you could do that with the whole offense that Dan like in Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah. That's kind of the deal, right? Like for, for me guys, my I have a problem, right? Like I, I have a serious problem. I just stacking is one thing. Like I love stacking, but I love stacking my quarterback and my tight ends. And and it's just like who am I stacking with mute? You know what I mean? Mm. It's like, I, I love pits and that's why I like dynasty pits because I can, you know, I'm kind of building that stack for the future, but it, it's tough to stack some of these guys. And I don't have a lot of youth. It's hard as much as we loved them last year. And like Theo said, we won a lot of leagues with them. It's hard for me this year, unless it's dynasty and I already own them uh, to be, you know, clicking the button to, to draft them, especially in these big money leagues. But who knows that that might be the key, right? Is getting a guy like, you know, Muth. And then stacking him with the Trubisky or whoever it is that that pulls some kind of miracle season or whatever it is. And a shout out to all of our league mates in the FFPC who allowed JD, Dan, and I to get so much moves at the end of the <laughs> second round and rookie drafts and early third round and rookie drafts. God bless you guys. I hope you enjoy your summer. But I don't think we can brush. I don't. I think I don't want to brush off a few guys here because my man, my man Coop is like kicking the hawk and got her to the curb. We, we, we know what you think of Goddard, um, but I, you got to back up because Dalton Schultz is one of the most polarizing guys in the, in the tight end premium streets. You're seeing him get extremely high drafted. I mean, you see the guy once in a while go ahead of Kittle. You see the guy once in a while go like the 401 in tight end premium. It's, it's nuts. Uh, Andrew Schellenberg and I did a football guys draft, the 350, where he went in the third round to a badged FFPC player, a very experienced guy. Um, who d- we would all recognize, and he took him in the end of the third round. So, like, I don't get it. Like, you bring up, I'll take Dallas Goddard at ADP any day of the week and twice on Sundays over Dalton Schultz where he's going sometimes. Am I completely wrong on this, Coop? And and Schultz is, like, you, you talk about in your article about how people need targets or or they need touchdowns, and he kind of had the perfect storm of both last year because I think he hit, like, 105, 10, something below 110 targets, and he had eight touchdowns. So it was like the perfect storm. Um, like you're asking a lot for him to, to hit that touchdown number again this year. Do you see him getting some astronomical target share that's going to carry him to tight end five or, or tight end six levels of drafting? Yeah, so the, the, the stat you're looking for there is that every top five tight end in PPR, going all the way back to Randy McMichael in 2003. How's that for a deep Damn. stat line? I'm Dan, had, Dan, Dan had him on his team a couple of teams back then. Has had either 90, 
So every top five tight end PPR, going back to Randy McMichael, has had either 90-plus targets or 10-plus touchdowns, right? Either one of those. And in half PPR, there's only one exception. Mark Andrews during the COVID year, he had 88 targets. He missed two games. So it pretty much stands true for both, right? You need those targets. You need those touchdowns. That's why. And the thing is, last year, no tight end had double-digit touchdowns. No one had 10. So that's why we care about the targets so much, man. That's why we care about those 90 targets, right? And that's why it's so hard to be the third target tight end and get 90. I mean, last year, depending where you look, either no team had three players on the team at all, three players at any position, get 100 plus targets, or the Cowboys just barely did. But, you know, Dalton Schultz in reality was the second target on the team. The problem with Schultz, as JJ Zacharyson pointed out, is that nobody, like, nobody thinks that he's really that good in a vacuum. I mean, he's not particularly fast. He is not good versus man to man. When you look at pro football focus, they say, they say, they say that he had 14 targets, uh, 14 receptions versus man to man. He actually had 15 that were completely uncovered. The rest were all against zone. This is a guy that benefited largely from being the extra, extra option on the team. And when you go and look at the highlights, you know, you guys know I'm not a big film guy, but I will watch to confirm the information. Like I like to look at the stats and then go back and look at the film and be like, what did I miss here? When you watch Dalton Schultz, I'm not feel I don't feel like I miss anything. Like there's not the one-handed catches and the, you know, the big yak and the broken tackles. It's basically a tight end that sneaks out in the flat when everyone else is getting covered and he scores a touchdown, you know, which in fantasy is great. And I think that when you talk about the start opportunity portion of that dynasty discussion, Dalton Schultz is certainly in that start opportunity, which is why when I when I take him, I'm willing to start him right away. It's just the player I don't love. I don't I just don't love him. I if he left the team, if he didn't get franchise tagged, he probably would have been this year's Austin Hooper, where he went to another team, they paid him a bunch of money, and he was there. You know what I mean? So that's my thoughts on him. Hawkinson is a guy that I do believe is talented. I think he's, you know, probably cut from the same rug, rug as George Kittle, where he's a very great, he's a good blocker and he's a good pass catcher. It's just a matter of if the offense could be productive. Both guys I'm willing to take at the right ADP and start early in the season, but I'm drafting a second tight end and I'm not spending up on them. I have, there's no, I feel no reason to reach on these guys. I just don't, I, I don't see why I would go out of my way, yeah, but I'll take, I, him, I, I'll take him a value. I, I want to piggyback on that with Hawkinson uh, and, and Schultz both, but Hawkinson, I mean, he's a guy that, you know, the, the talent is very obvious, but you look at how the lions have constructed their, their roster and their offense and they're, you know, they're just <laughs> not, you know, they, they're not going to feature the tight end. They're just not going to do it. I mean, if he, yeah. you know, if some people get hurt, then yeah, he's going to fall into a lot of targets again. But until he goes to a different team, uh, you know, where the, you know, they change the offense around him somehow, it, it, it's just not going to work out for him. Schultz is like the exact opposite. He's like uh, the bizarro TJ Hawkinson. He has no talent whatsoever. He's, you know, you, you, you put your top 20 tight ends by ADP. Uh, Dalton Schultz is easily the least talented of any of them. And, you know, to, to have him being drafted as, you know, like your tight end six, um, overall, that's that's a little bit too rich for me because I'm, I'm counting on too many other factors to do the work that he can't necessarily do for himself. So, you know, that that, that makes him problematic as well. And, you know, Godert, same thing, uh, you know, super talented. He's more much more like Hawkinson. But he's a guy I just have a little bit more trouble with because of the fact that they got A.J. Brown. Um, you know, the, it's a really low volume passing attack. They've still got Devonta Smith to take care of. You know, it, I, th- I think you can tell yourself a story that Goddard ended, ends up second on the team in targets. Uh, you know, I, I, I see that path. I can sit there and I can look at it and say, well, yeah, it could happen. I just can't make myself believe it personally. Dan, Dan, you're the tight end whisperer. Who's tight, who's Dallas's tight end two right now? God, I, know. I know this one. No Google. No, no Google allowed. No, I know this one because he was. It's the rookie. They drafted the, the Wisconsin tight end. Fourth round guy. Yeah, yeah. Guy. It's a Wisconsin tight end. Give me a name. Anderson. Want a name? Uh, uh, Ferguson. 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 Yes. Nice. Thank you. There you go. There you go, famous Jay. Uh, I wanna. I wanna point out, like, so. I, Here's here's the the bullish argument on Hawkinson. Hawkinson hit like 12 points a game last year, um, and he was injured for a lot of the year. Um, and he also saw saw a lot of attention in coverage. This year they add Shark. Jamison Williams is, is coming. We expect Amon Ross St. Brown to take a step forward. And DeAndre Swift is healthy. 
even if Hawkinson just hits 12 points a game and stays healthy, like that's an impactful number. Um, that was regular PPR scoring. He hit that. So in FFPC, he could be, you know, even more impactful. And like, I got Hawkinson only once so far, but I got him at a 607 where last year he was going in the fourth round. Like we all think he's talented and we think the offense is ascending. I don't think that's a guy that I don't want any shares of. Um, and I'll also take a bullish argument on Goddard because I believe in his talent and his target. Like you bring up the Ertz thing. He was definitely fortunate that Ertz was traded hundred percent, but he, after Ertz was traded, his target share went bananas. Like Goddard had a huge target share and I know they add the, the alpha, but like, I, I can't discount that. So like, I'm more apt to take a Hawkinson or a Goddard um, this year. Cause I think if I can get them in the sixth and seventh round of tight end premium and like Dan and, and NFFC, like crazy late for both those guys, Dan and I got a Dallas Goddard share on an, on an NFFC team uh, that we split early on. Um, and we got him, Dan, I don't remember, but it was super late. Um, it was, it was so, like ninth or 10th round, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like, it was like 10th round. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take a bullish stance on both those guys. Um, I think that, like you said, when you watch a guy like Schultz, he seems like a, a player and a great opportunity. Um, when I watch Goddard and I watch Hawkinson, I see guys that I think are extremely talented football players. Um, and they're both going in kind of that range that Mark Andrews was drafted at last year where he was like tight end six overall drafted uh, and he ends up being tight end one. So like, I'm not completely discounting those guys. So, so we can kind of butt heads a little bit on those two guys. What about Ertz this year though, Coop? I want to get your opinion on him because he seems to be kind of in his own tier. It's like the Goddard Hawkinson guy goes, go right after Schultz. And then it seems like Ertz is his own tier. What JD's showing you here is he's in, a, he's the only tight end in the seventh round. Occasionally we'll see him go late sixth. Um, but he's kind of like, you have a lot of people who really love him. Um, he was tight end six last year and he, he's had like, I think it was four games with nine targets or more in Arizona. So like things really fell great for him. Do you see it this year being a year where he's going to return value going at like this tight end eight ish tight end nine? Well, that, that's the thing with all these guys in this range is that you can make an argument for either side and whenever you can do that, like you're kidding yourself if you believe that you can just call it right every, every single time. You have to leave room for uncertainty, right? So that's why for me, when I look at Kelsey, Andrews, Pitts, like it's set up where they're top two targets. There would need to be uh, catastrophic uh, situations for them not to be. Whereas these guys, you and I, no matter how much you love Dallas Goddard, Theo, you know he could he could be the third target on the team, right? Like we know that. 100%. But we, we know he could be the second target, right? So that's why for me, whenever I'm in that land of uncertainty, I'm taking a second guy. We're waiting long enough on these tight ends, including Ertz. Round seven's long enough where I've drafted. You know, if you wait on Ertz, and I know this guy drafted Schultz and Ertz, which, which is super weird. But if you if you wait long enough on Ertz, then you can – or is this tight end premium, this draft? Yeah, this, this, is, is, this, this is just an ADP premium. board. Yep. Yeah, it's just the, the recent last three days ADP for the football guys. Yeah, okay. Okay. So it's going to just – Sort them wherever. So that's why this guy drafted like seven tight ends. Yeah. He's not, okay. he's not a tight end. Yes, yeah. He's not into him that much. <laughs> or it's not real. I was like, this guy, dude. Okay, dude. This, this is my kind of dude. Like, not really, but kind of a guy, I guess. Um, but uh, it was yeah, Andrew Cooper in the, 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 the heaviest tight end team we could find. And we're like, this yeah. is the one you got to show. He drafted yeah, 11 tight ends. ends. They were all studs. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's what my Scott Fishbowl who's, team who's is. He's actually your stalker, Coop. Um, <laughs> 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 he wouldn't have drafted Robert Tunyon. He wouldn't have drafted Tunyon if he, if he did, yeah, if he true. was. But yeah, but I went out of my way actually in Scott Fishbowl to not take a ton of tight ends because I know I'm going to add them off waivers. Last year I drafted a bunch and added them. It was just it was just a mess of tight ends, you know. But um, yeah, but so that's my thought process with these guys is that like Ertz, like he was great last year with with and without DeAndre Hopkins but especially without he had the second he had the third most red zone targets of any tight end and the second most end zone targets i mean like for tight ends that can you ask for much more you know what i mean he's always been a rock solid guy in terms of uh getting himself open and catching the ball he's never going to break a huge you know gains but you don't we don't really care that much about that in PPR right so that's why Ertz for me 
it's the perfect guy to draft and start while Hopkins is out, but you have to give yourself a shot of upside. The one thing that I disagree with, and that this goes for pretty much anybody in this group, is just drafting one of them and then not giving yourself a chance at upside. Because when you draft a back end tight end one and he finishes back end tight end one, that's like the formula for cruising into third place. The rest of your team has to carry you. That's why I, I love drafting these guys and starting them, but give yourself a shot at upside. Try and find that, well, that special guy. Out, right? Give it's like it's like running back, right? When you're taking those late guys, you're giving yourself an out for maybe your hero RB or zero RB, but you you you've got outs now. You know? Dude, JD, that's exactly it, bro. That's exactly drafting, waiting, and just taking one tight end is like drafting zero RB and then not filling your bench with RBs. Exactly, it's like the opposite of the strategy. That's the opposite of how it's supposed to work. I'm not saying fill your bench with tight ends. You can use one spot. If you wait until the tenth round to take your first tight end, then you can draft four running backs and five wide receivers. Do you need another seven wide receivers on your bench? No, dude, no. You can you you can have six wide receivers on your bench and one tight end. You know what I mean? So give yourself a, sh- a shot at upside, dude. It, it it's it blows my mind. This these people that picked up a magazine in 2007 at some point and read you know in a gas station that you can only ever draft one tight end and that's what they stuck with for their entire career. Oh, I only ever draft one. It's like, dude, that's so archaic. Use your bench to for league winning upside. Improve the positions that you're bad at. Pat, like if you think about 2017 specifically, or sorry, 2019, like if you went out and took a quarterback, if you waited and took a late quarterback and a late tight end, and then took the tight end 15 and the tight end Q and then and the QB 15, you would have got Mark Andrews and Patrick Mahomes as your second tight end or your second quarterback, and you would have obliterated your league. You know what I mean? Like people have to be like that's how you get access to these guys. People that read my articles or draft with me, like, or if you're drafting with me, you're not going to get to pick up these guys off waivers. They don't hit waivers. So that that's my that's my rant. Sorry about that, JD. But you un- no. you unleashed something in me when you said that because it drives me nuts, bro. It drives me nuts, man. It really is like zero RB drafters saying, ah, "I'll just skip the position entirely." Do, you do can't you, do that. Do you have a hard out, Andrew? Because I even asked you, Coop, before we came on, like, because we're 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 sixty in, and we 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 got a bit bit more to go. I'm down. I'm down to hang, and I'm down to hang. Nice. Good. So I I want to get I want to get Coop's like picks in this this next this this tier is big. So we want to get your favorites in this tier, but I want to get I'll go a little bit deep into Cole Komet, who's been a goat district favorite this entire off season. He's kind of like a like an arbitrage play on some of these guys that are going ahead of him in a sense, because he's going to get similar total targets. Do you agree on that sentiment? Um, and do you see him as a guy who's going to return a lot of value this year? Williamson, do, are you a commit guy? Did you bring him to the table? <laughs> I am. Totally Dan is the commit guy. Whisper, I, 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 I you, you would think that Dan gave birth to, to commit. Dan, that makes me so goddamn proud, brother. That's my <laughs> boy. Dude. I really oh, That makes me that that, that gets me fired. Komet and and Evan Ingram, he's like on cloud nine for the weekend. Yeah, those are the boys, man. Those are the boys, Williamson. Yeah, you know, you know the deal, brother. Oh, yeah. So absolutely. that's yeah. the thing with Komet. I mean, I've been banging the drum on Komet since January. I mean, no lie, bro. If you were, t- if you were. T- if you are somebody out there that just, you know, you did your dog actually ate your homework, right? And you needed to study for the exam, but you could have one cheat sheet that had like two words written on it, you know, or like that uh, draft, blah, 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 no matter what, right on there. Who has a shot? Who has a top two upside within the range of outcomes? Cole Komet last year was a top two target on the team, and that was with Allen Robinson. Do we really think that Byron Pringle or a 47 year old Valus Jones Jr. are going to come in and take enough? Uh, targets for him not to be able to get he had 93 last year right all we're asking for is for him to be who he was last year and then maybe get a little better in man-to-man situations you can't be catching zero touchdowns right Right. but i mean he can't catch less right he can't be worse in that category and if you if you really boil it down which i did in the article uh, he's in the yin yang tight end article which is the fourth one in the series if you guys check out the one that that uh you guys have been linking out there the top one at the bottoms all four of them from the series and uh cool command people people forget that jimmy graham inexplicably last year got like six end zone targets and if you go in and look at it uh jimmy graham uh, Jesse James, 
all these guys, Jesper Horstead, they combined for a ton of touchdowns. Like they combined for six touchdowns. If you just give Cole Komet a couple of those touchdowns, that you got a stew going, baby. So let, this is a guy that could easily, I mean, cross the 90 target threshold the, last year, and he just needs a couple more touchdowns to, to deliver. He's a guy I'm, I'm willing, that's the whole reason I'm willing to pass on Dallas Goddard, that whole group, is because I'll wait and I'll grab a guy like Komet uh, and some of these other guys from the group. So you guys are right to be on Komet, and that's why I come on this show, because I think you guys are smart. In my, I did an arbitrage article on Player Profiler, and I had Komet as like the arbitrage play to, to Schultz. What percentage do you put at Komet out targeting Schultz this year? It's got to be like 45%. It's yeah. I mean, like that's that's the thing is that we know that C.D. Lamb is one. We're confident Darnell Mooney is one. But Darnell Mooney got 140 targets last year. I mean, you can't like he can't get that many more than that. And he, dude, for him to be wide receiver 23 with 140 targets. But is there any reason for him not to get it again? You know, I don't think there's any. Oh, I mean, I'm in on I'm in on Mooney. I'm in. Like, I mean, they they are clearly doing some sort of pseudo bridge here. It's crazy to me that they also messed messed up where they're not going to get a comp pack comp pick back for Allen Robinson. But that's a totally different rant on just the Bears messing up. But like, uh, Mooney should get those targets. Komet should get his. And I mean, it's just hard for me not to take this guy. Like, I'm at the point where if I miss on everybody, I'll take him and start him week one. And if I take someone like uh, Ertz to start the first six weeks. I'm getting commit too. I'll grab him too. And if I miss on commit, there's a couple other guys we like. You know, you already said Evan Ingram, which uh, yeah, I wrote the Bible on that guy. And I will go to the loony bin on that player if I have to. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'll tell you what, dude. I'll tell you right now. If he sucks this year, then I swear to God, I'll be back again next year. If he goes to a different team, I don't care if he goes to the the CFL. I'll be up there with you. And the, and the Canadians are in the mono up there, man. Because I think I, he's just, dude, the upside is always going to be there. 4-4, four, four, you know? Uh, yeah. But, yeah, Cole Komet, I'm in. I'm in, boys. Keep talking about Ingram. Like, that is that your one of your main guys in this 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 uh, big, you know, huge tier of, of tight ends? Well, Dan knows. We've been talking about uh, – we've been on the Ingram wagon for a while, man. And it's just – that's the thing for me. How many guys could – how many guys could even be top two targets on their team? Let's go through it right now. Let's throw them out one at a time, starting at the top. Like we'll go around real quick. I'll go first. Travis Kelsey. That's one. That could that could lead their team in targets, realistically. Mark Andrews, Kyle Pitts, TJ Hawkinson, George mm-hmm. Kittle, Dalton Schultz. I'll throw Sh- Schultz is tough though. I, Schultz yeah. with Lamb. I don't know, with Lamb there? Yeah, I'd be, oh, it, it, oh no, well, well, yeah, I thought you were talking about I thought you meant yeah. top, yeah. top, top, top straight Hurts good with Hopkins straight. out. Straight, straight up, straight up lead. Absolutely not. That's uh, Ertz yeah. could with Hop, while Hopkins out. Ertz yeah. could lead. Ertz Hawk scratch, scratch Schultz. He's got zero shot. Hawk could. I think Hawk could. Oh, Hawk, Hawk did. Yeah. Hawk did last year. I mean, I know you don't like Goddard, but I, because you would think Hertz is going to spread the ball so much. I mean, you know, AJB should get it. But AJ's AJ's going to AJ's going to get it. Even if AJ yeah. has a disappointing year. Even if AJ has like 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 AJ's AJ's floor targets. In Philly, if he plays a full season, is still like yeah, damn, it's, like it's twenty five to one thirty. Any of these guys, I mean, Knox, with, yeah, Knox with Diggs there, Alberto with no. Gian, and there's, Sutton there. there. There's there's none. There's literally almost none after that. Those top a, AJ guys. AJ Brown's in that category where the owner the owner calls you into those private meetings and says, <laughs> "What did I spend a hundred million dollars on?" You know what I mean? That's that's David, the thing with and Joku might. David and Joku might. You know, okay, right? so that now we're getting into some interesting names, man. You this is a discussion. The no, but I love it though because this is a discussion that I like, dude. It's like, right? Oh, here's one. Here's one. Ready? Austin Hooper. Yeah. I mean, like, it's just no. Gross, though, hey, no, but maybe. No, but maybe. And that's so. In the early parts of your draft, you ask yourself, why? Why am I spending up for Travis Kelsey? Why am I spending up on Mark Andrews? When we get in the later parts, start asking why not. Why can't oh, Evan Ingram? Three one on the table. I'll throw a dirty, dirty Noah Fant out there. Do it. I don't, come on, he can easily be leading. Right, that. best friends. He was a he was top two target on. The, I know injuries and and Jerry Judy not even being the lead played part of, but he was top two target on the team before. And the, you know, this some Drew Locke came out and he said he said something like uh, you know uh, that the Broncos weren't using him right and that we're gonna unlock him. I don't really like Fant because he's in a similar position that he was in before. But that's the thing for everyone out there listening. Don't draft the guys that I tell you to draft. That's stupid. Like fantasy football is supposed to be fun. 
take the things I'm saying and apply it to what you think happens. I see guys in the chat saying Komet sucks. Good. Don't draft Komet. Or Schultz can do it. When that when Famous J put that up there, when he said Schultz can do it, if you think Schultz can be a top two target on his team, which is what Famous J said, you should draft Schultz because that's what you believe and you're going to feel good about that. The, the, the thing I want to discourage are people saying, I think Goddard's going to be third on the team in targets. I'm going to draft him. You're betting against yourself, dude. You're putting yourself in a jam. Doing you got to tell the right story, right? That to match your draft. Exactly. Yeah. Tell yourself, figure out what you think is going to happen, and then use the the metrics and the guidelines I'm giving you to to capitalize on it. You know, so so that's that's where I'm at. So it's like you when you paint that picture with any of these guys, you know, Brevin Jordan. I don't know. I was just gonna right. say that. If, if, yeah, if you're high on Noah Fant, you probably better not be too high on Tyler Lockett. Uh, you know. True. Yes. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. You got to you got to fade somebody. You got to fade somebody. And it worked out. I mean, Amari Cooper. Amari Cooper was wide receiver like twenty seven. So to be, he had to be fade. It's just the way it goes. But I, but I feel like anytime there's a new quarterback situation, like in Seattle, you never really know who the quarterback's going to gravitate to. You know, you don't and know. Tight end is easily the first place they do. You know, when 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 the when they're in a new position as a quarterback. Yeah. Uh, 100% man to change like that's why we love Kelsey like more than anything and that's why we love these like the wide receivers in the Bengals offense now in Dynasty I love it in Dynasty because like it's so locked in for for how even Tyler Boyd's under contract which he's like such a shield for those other two guys right a guy that comes in for three wide receiver sets and then comes out of the game for two wide receiver sets and isn't really threatening to their target share that's the perfect thing for Dynasty you want you want things to stay the same you want Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill and Patrick Mahomes forever and ever. And, you know, now that's changing. But, like, you don't want – or I guess when you when you have the guys that are in the mix of the bottom, you want change. Like Evan Ingram. It's such a – it's all over the place. Why not? I say, why not Evan Ingram, right? Like, he could he could lead the team in targets. He could be second. Right. And and, and just to, you know, to, to flesh out Evan Ingram a little bit more, aside from just Ingram's natural abilities – He's going to a team, uh, you know, with a coach who has featured the tight end heavily in the past. And Trevor Lawrence was peppering tight ends last year with targets. You know, so you have all these things kind of lining up, you know. So this is one of those things where, it, you know, is Evan Ingram going to be successful this year or not? I don't know. But that's a bet that I would rather make with a late pick like that. Because it's late enough that if you're wrong, so what? You know? Boom. That's it. So who cares, right? You drop him and you move on to the next guy. But I'm telling you, I, but damn, we weren't, Hey, we weren't dreaming when we saw James O'Shaughnessy get eight targets, right? Like right, right. that, without, that, did, that actually happened, right? Like we saw Dan Arnold get traded to the team off the streets and leave the team in targets for a couple of games there. Young and back man, young quarterback. He goes, to that's, that's what I'm saying. And we watched Evan Ingram be a top five tight end in fantasy with the shell of Eli Manning. And just the year before last, people people joke about him making the Pro Bowl, but he was fourth in targets, fifth in receptions, eight in yards. The fans voted for TJ Hawkinson and Robert Tunyon. The players and coaches voted for Evan Ingram, and that's why he went to the Pro Bowl. And on that, that team was dead last in touchdowns. That team's been dead last in touchdowns over the last two seasons, offensive touchdowns. And... Uh, Daniel Jones has more interception or he has more turnovers and touchdowns over the last two seasons. It's like, maybe things will be better. That, that's what you're betting on. And it's, I, you just can't get, you can't show me higher upside. I mean, you can't show me a lower floor. The guy has a clearly has a difficult time at times catching the football, but when he does catch it, man, four, four speed, this guy's taking, he has, he has at least six plays of 50 plus yards. So that's why I'm excited about it. And I don't care if he's like, you can't even phase me if he sucks. Cause I'll be like, so what dude, what I wasted an eight 17th round pick or whatever it was. Get out of here. Yeah. Do, exactly. you, 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 you touched on, you touched great on Ingram. We, we really like Ingram. Dan's all over him. Um, you mentioned Austin Hooper. There's a couple other interesting tight ends in this kind of like below the dead zone tier. David Njoku, who JD brought up. And then Gerald Everett and Tyler Higby, who were sitting in in very very good offenses, none of these guys are, are are really threats to lead their teams in in targets by any means. But do you have any interest in taking a couple shots on Everett or Higby? Yeah, so those two I don't, and I'll tell you why. So Gerald Everett is in the same boat as Hayden Hurst, 
where he's the the fourth target on the team, right? We think that Hayden Hurst is going to be the fourth target on the team. Or do you think he gets more targets than Tyler Boyd? No, absolutely not. So here's the, when you look at the receiving stats for Austin Eckler, they were virtually identical to Tyler Boyd. Austin Eckler is Tyler Boyd for all intents and purposes. Like I, Austin Eckler might have had more targets than Tyler Boyd. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I looked at them and I was like, these they're putting up the same numbers. So when you start doing the math like that, where it's like Hayden Hurst is battling with Tyler Boyd for a near irrelevant third spot on the target totem pole, I don't want Hayden Hurst. And when it's the same thing with Austin Eckler and Keenan Allen and um, Mike Williams, then, then I'm not really interested. I mean, in best ball, best ball washes away the sins of touchdown dependency. And we could see Gerald Everett easily being a younger, better Jared Cook. I think that's a big argument there. And of course he could catch some touchdowns. The question is when. So when I'm setting my lineup, I'm too sc- I'm too scared of that. I, I hate it. Even when you, if you had Robert Tunya in the year he had 11 touchdowns, it was all fun and games and, you know, ring around the posy until championship week where he caught one pass and it wasn't a touchdown. And he pulled your pants down in front of all your friends in your league. That's, that's the reality of these touchdown dependent guys. So that's why I'm just not super excited about you know, Hurst, Everett, Higby, who's never been athletic, and they have Allen Robinson, and they have Cooper Cup, and Matt Stafford's elbow is falling off, and they're definitely going to bring back Odell Beckham Jr., and Van Jefferson's pretty good too. So I'm just not super excited about those guys. On the flip side, Njoku, perfect position to be a top two target on the team. David Bell hasn't even been practicing. Mari Cooper is Amari Cooper. He could be next. He's a physical freak. We like it. Uh, and then who is the other guy that you that you mentioned there? Who I also like, whoever it was. Uh, no, well, you you we can we can go back to Austin Hooper. I didn't ask you about him, but you seem excited to talk about Austin Hooper. So so did I, I say I Hooper or right Joku here. just now? You oh, said Joku. 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 Did, did say Hooper though. He's he mentioned Hooper earlier as a guy who could be oh yeah, yeah, yeah dark yeah, horse yeah. to lead the team in targets. Yeah. Um, so maybe, oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go expand on Hooper. I think that's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I mean, I group these guys into, I kind of, you kind of, you have to kind of group them, right? So like Cole Komet, because of the lack of touchdowns, but the targets are there. Him and Engram, I think they're similar players, like PPR players. You want to take, right? I take guys like Dawson Knox and Hunter Henry, who could be top two targets on their team. Depends how much you like a Gabe Davis or somebody like that. But they both had nine touchdowns last year, right up against the threshold we need to be, you know, to cross over. So like. I like those guys, especially if you play standard or half PPR, right? Like they're they're good versus man to man, those type guys. Austin Hooper for me at this stage of the game is a guy that I think falls kind of in that Knox or Hunter Henry range where you can make an argument for him to be a top two target on the team. And we've seen him ha- have some success in terms of touchdowns, both with Atlanta and with Cleveland. And you hear stuff coming from Bryant Dano where he says that they stay after practice working on timing routes that Austin Hooper has taught him a bunch of things that he learned from Matt Ryan, different guys. So I'm kind of intrigued to that, especially with Robert Woods coming back from injury, trailing Burks got some weird stuff going on. It's like, give yourself a shot. He could be brutal and then you just drop him. But like, that's what I'm looking for. Like I can't in good conscience draft draft Hayden Hurst instead of Austin Hooper. When I just, I look at what's possible and what, what I don't think is possible. And then, how about Dan or JD? Anything to add on on any of those guys? No, I, I got a couple other guys I want to throw in the ring. So if Dan has anything to add on on the hoopster or, or anyone else, and Joku, I mean, I feel like in Joku, kind of everyone's on on top of that. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, personally, I have a lot of trouble getting behind in Joku just because uh, I don't know that Watson's going to play, and uh, I, I don't think. Jacoby Brissett is a, a very good quarterback for you know for any skill player. Yeah, and you're gonna hurt his, you're gonna hurt his feelings. He listens. No, 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 no. I mean, you know, <laughs> Brissett could uh, he could win some games, but uh, I just don't necessarily want to be attached to his skill players other than maybe his running backs. So, um, and Joku is right now a hard pass for me because there's other guys I like better, as in uh, Evan Ingram. That We're right beside him there on the board. Yeah. <laughs> so. You know, or, you know, if I miss, if I miss on somebody like that, you know, like I, I, I'll go deep, deep, deep at tight end, you know, like Brevin Jordan, I'll go Mo Alley Cox, you know, these, these are guys that I, you know, even Greg Dulcich, I can, uh, I can kind of get yeah, behind a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So, I love those um, names, brother. 
Yeah, but what I what I want to know, I like let's let's talk Jets tight ends real quick. What do you what do you see between uh Conklin and uh Uzoma? What do you what do you got there, Coop? Yeah, so t- uh, to me that one that one is pretty easy between the two. It's Uzoma. He's just a he profiles as the better pass catcher. There's no tight end in the league that blocked on more pass plays last year than Tyler Conklin. And that's even with Adam Thielen out. There's no tight end out there where the coach said we got to throw the ball here. Why don't you stay in and block? And that, to me, is a huge indictment on this player. And it's been the type of player that he is. So I think that's they brought him in to be that guy, and Uzoma is going to skew more pass catching. Now, again, it's kind of interesting with the the setup there. Um, it's really scary for the wide receivers, that setup. Because if you think about what the Ravens do, right? Let's take for two seconds, just think about the Ravens, where they use, so, they use a fullback on like 50% of the snaps. And then, so every time you bring in a fullback, a wide receiver comes out. So now you got two wide receivers in. Every time you bring in Nick Boyle or a blocking tight end, another wide receiver comes out. That's why Marquise Brown is the only wide receiver playing a full snap share there. You can go back and look. No one, going back, like, uh, two years, in 2019, Willie Sneed led the wide receivers in snaps with, like, a 16% snap share. Like, it is ugly. Marquise Brown's the only one that played a full snap share. Then you go and look at what the Jets are setting up over there. They went out and paid two tight ends a bunch of money. They have two fullbacks on the roster. Corey Davis is one of the better blocking wide receivers, which is so super annoying for fantasy. It's like I'm just worried for the I'm worried for everybody over there. I'm worried it's you know, it's I just don't find a world where I am interested in taking a Jets. I've, I've had I th- a hard time drafting yeah, Garrett Wilson. I, I'll I'll take some Elijah Moore, but Garrett Wilson is just it, it's it's been too hard. I'll tell you right now, I think one of those guys is going to be awesome. I think one of those guys, Elijah Moore or Garrett Wilson, is going to, going to outperform ADP. And the game is is kind of figuring out which one, right? Like, it's like, because you're going to have one, you're going to have Corey Davis playing a lot of split end. You know, he's just, they paid him. He's good block. He played 94% of the snaps when he was healthy. He's a good blocker. One of the other guys is going to play every snap. And it's just, you know, I, I want some of it. Best ball plays. Best ball plays, I feel like, right? I don't know. JD, you look like you got something to say on one of these. The one he of wants to receivers. talk about he wants to talk about Robert Tunyon. I want to talk about my boys, man. My Albert O, my Tanyan, you know? Get him right. in there. Get him in there. Because I I'll start with Tanyan because I know you don't like Tanyan as much. Uh I get the eleven touchdowns. I, I get I get all of that. But don't you think like I think he it's it's hard to get the trust from Rogers. Right, I, I, I keep it simple. Like that's I keep it simple. Mm-hmm. He he built that trust with Rodgers. Eleven touchdowns didn't come out of nowhere. So I get what you're saying. Then he got injured. Don't you think coming back in this in the current environment, he's someone that that Rodgers already knows. He's familiar with. He trusts. He's gonna have to put a lot of trust on a lot of the guys around him. Lazard is there for sure. Lazard, however you, you want to say it, mm-hmm. and he's obviously built that trust because you hear it in Rodgers, but. I just feel like talking narrow, you know, we like to talk about narrow target trees. I feel like Green Bay could easily, bump, yeah, he could easily spread it around, but he could easily go Lazard and, and you know, um, I was listening to someone today saying Lazard. That's why I'm saying Lazard. I usually say Lazard. Yeah. Uh, I think it was Davis Maddock. But, um, yeah, I just I just like in Green Bay, I'm just thinking, where who the hell is Rodgers throwing the ball to other than the running backs and, and Lazard, right? So, uh, I don't know, just – you know, give me your thoughts on that. And do you not think maybe he'll be more part of the game? Maybe he's going to be on the field more often than, you know, what we've seen in the past. Yeah, they, they, they need to give us a, a pronunciation guide because it's like La- Lazard, Lazard, Tunyon, Tonyan. I mean, dude, every once in a while somebody says uh, Alvin Kamara or Kamara. And I start thinking to myself, I'm like, if I've been saying this wrong the whole yeah. time, I don't even, you know, it's like, it's, I'm with you, man. It's, it's tough, brother. It's I'm tough. Canadian, dude. Yeah. So it's, it's everything is, is like, am I saying? This right, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there it's, was not, a it's gotta be it's gotta be Lazard then for for the French. Yeah. Lazard, Lazard, right? well, the first time I saw that, that was Lazard. Like that's that's how I would have said it. You know, there was, the there's a, now. I'm not sure if you guys are hockey guys. There's a hockey player that played for New Jersey for like eight years, and the everyone in New Jersey was like, "Yeah, Zach Parisi." Yeah, and Par- then yeah, yeah, yeah. Parisi. And then, so Parisi. And then he went. Yeah, and then he went to. Then he went to the wild, and he was like, "By the way, my name is Paris." Yes. And everyone was like, "No, it's not." <laughs> I'm like too late for that, Parisi. You know what I mean? Like, yes, but but anyway, dude. So hey, that's why you have to look at this as opportunities, man. Because Dan will Dan will tell you. Like I've crushed Onion throughout the years, have I, like, right? Like I've I've kind of smoked him, man. But you're right. Conditions have changed, 
And now there's just so many and, you know, vacated targets is it's just such a I don't like the term, but Aaron Rodgers is you're such a weird dude. Like he'll throw 15 touchdown passes to James Jones wearing a sweatshirt if he feels like it, you know, <laughs> and he came out. He came out and he said he's saying all these things that we say. Right. He's saying let lads going to be the wide receiver one. He's saying, well, there's just going to be, there's going to be just as many targets and touchdowns. It's just a matter of where they go. Like that's things that we say. Why this guy is saying that like Rogers is, he's such a different cat that I, I do to a certain degree subscribe. So in normal years, like last year, I was so off Tunyon and he came out last year and I know people want to lean on the injury, but he was bad last year. These are, these were his games. And this is the scary part, right? This is what makes him, for me, just a best ball play is that here's his game log last year. Here, let me pull it up. Yeah, I got it. I got it here. He's, yeah, he's. Read me the yardage totals. Read me the yardage totals for the first like five, six. Games. Yeah, like eight yards, 52 yards, six yards, eight yards, eight yards, 10 yards. Yeah. He's got like 100 <laughs> targets in his career, fellas. This is. <laughs> why, is not this, happening. I need an awakening. You know, this is a. What is that? Those things where you intervene or whatever? What's that called? Yeah, yeah. The, the interventions. Yeah. But at the same time, but at the same time, bro, at the same time, I'm with you, man, because I can see it. I can see what you're saying. I can see it. And we saw it, right? We saw him score three touchdowns against the Falcons. Like, we saw all these things happen. So, like, well, so I think price. his price is nice. You know what I mean? His it's price, risk. The risk reward is there. It's free, baby. It's free. So take somebody else, take somebody else. And then when you're taking your stabs, because like the whole yin yang tight end thing, which is my whole philosophy is rotate, rotate that, that second guy, be willing to drop him. I was so in on Jimmy Graham, uh, the, the year before last. And even I was like, you have to drop Jimmy Graham to add Logan Thomas after week one. I was like, this guy played 100% of the snaps. He played them all at wide receiver. I'm like, you have to do it. You have to hold them. Because it's like, you have to make those moves. So like, That was a winning move, man. Right. I, you had to hold them for so long, too. But it was like, the numbers were there. That's why we look at the routes from. We look at all these stupid things that are behind the scene. But like, you can see the post that I sent. I was like, my heart says Jimmy Graham. But the numbers, man. You got to put the numbers. So... Uh, well, you could yeah. you could have uh, you could have Rogers go back on the, the Ayahuasca, get on some psychedelics, <laughs> and he could have some flashbacks, <laughs> flashbacks <laughs> to the three. He could have flashback Ayahuasca. He could have yeah. flashbacks to the three tight uh, three <laughs> touchdown uh, Monday Night Football game, and just target your man Tunyon so you could return a little value there, JD. I'm, I'm, yeah. If I'm any one of those wide receivers, I'm definitely hitting up the dark web, and I'm like, you want to come the over Ayahuasca this weekend? Narrative. Yeah, yeah Tunyon, come on. I, I got you. I got <laughs> a little you, breakfast, a little yeah. breakfast DMT narrative. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there honestly, though, if whatever it takes, man. That's why. That's why Eli Wolf got cut, dude. He's probably straight edge. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no trips to South America, Aaron. I'm- <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, on Tanyan, I mean, here's here's the thing for me. If it weren't for the injury. I would be more, more willing to draft him right now. He's one of those guys that, especially, you know, in best ball leagues, I will, I, I'll still grab a, a small amount if I can get some, but on leagues where I'm able to, to turn my roster, I'm kind of feeling like he's probably not going to play or play well for the first third of the season anyway. And so, you know, somebody's going to get tired of holding him on the roster and drop him. And, you know, I want to wait for, you know, to kind of see him, come back and show that he can do it. Now, if he shows he can do it in the preseason or we're getting, you know, the, the drumbeat of great news out of camp, then, you know, I, I can still jump in and I can still get enough shares that I'm not too worried about it. But other, other than that, I mean, I just, I find it so hard to back these injured guys, you know, especially, you know, Logan Thomas is another guy kills me to say it. I love Logan Thomas. I've got Logan Thomas all over the bottom of my dynasty rosters, but he's going to be a hard guy to, you know, to hit the, the the draft button on and uh, I have zero Logan Thomas. He, he won me money a couple of years ago, but I have zero Logan Thomas. Yeah, and, and, you know, but that knee injury, it's just you know, it, with with Tunyon and Thomas, they were both pretty bad knee injuries. They're both kind of late in the year, so I, I just I have a hard time betting on them this year. It's, it's somebody I think I might come around to again next year. That's a crazy depth chart, man. That Washington one, because so mm-hmm. I actually just mentioned Eli Wolf. That's like like kind of almost like a joke player but like he when you look at his metrics like he's fast he's like good he got picked up by the commanders eli right. wolf did i have an open bet out there that eli wolf liked on twitter he he on his own account liked this i said if he made the 50 if he makes a 53 man roster i'll shotgun a tall boy straw that's, <laughs> that's, what I have. 
that's the bet out there. I go for Eli Wolf. But like when you look at this Washington roster, like if this is when we need to watch week one super close because John Bates kind of interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Logan. So Logan Thomas, we already know, was playing 100 percent of the snaps. John Bates kind of interesting. They draft Cole Turner, right? Who rookie? Who knows? They had Samus Rays already. This guy. Rays, he dude, he was a he's a basketball player, converted basketball player. The exact kind of profile that becomes interesting. Now they got my boy Eli Wolf. This team has five different dudes that you know. Who knows if you know people are saying Curtis Samuel's out of shape. John Dotson is a rookie. I mean, who knows? Like that offense, we've seen them feature a tight end. If somebody could come out of there, it that that's like a, just a watch list situation for me. Yeah, and and I hate like Rays would be the interesting one to me because. Like he's he's just a different kind of athlete, yes. and like we all we all talk about like every NFL player, like showing a player a picture of an NFL player being muscular is no is like no thing, or a super athlete is no thing. But Ray's is like a freak, like the guy mm. is is a ridiculous basket like a like a basketball player. He's super jacked, uh, super fast. Like people at the Washington camp last year were talking about how they were like so wowed by his athleticism. Um, but again, he's a late bloomer because you know hardly any football experience. But if he wins out, that's that's the guy for me. Bro, look at Eli. Well, so Sammy's like Ray's dude. He's a um, he's a stud, but dude, Eli. I mean, dude, this cannot be an Eli Wolf. This is the Eli Wolf podcast now. <laughs> Eli Wolf, man, he ran like <laughs> a, uh, dude. He ran dude. This guy six, basically six five, ran a four four three. That's like. Kyle Pitts, Evan Ingram. No one's doing that. That's a hundredth percentile speed, right? Like he was, a, he walked on to a school that, uh, <laughs> not entertained like that, that. Like this is a guy to Eli Wolf that if you're in one of those crazy 32 team dynasty leagues, just throw him out there. This guy's just, you know, he's looking for a chance, man. Like your dynasty waiver wires right now. Like who else are you grabbing? You know what I mean? Right. Out there. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need to drop anybody of consequence. I'm just saying. Just keep an eye on the name. The guy's got the athleticism. That's all we care about. Like, when you get into that crazy deep tier that we're talking about here, that's what we care about. Right, Theo? Like, when you talk about Sammy's race, like, you want to hear guys saying, this guy's a freakazoid, and he doesn't know how to play tight end. And I'm like, perfect. Teach this guy I'm to looking, play tight end. I'm looking, I'm looking at, at Eli Wolf. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm going to read a little bit more about him after after the pod. But he's... Uh, Definitely name him to keep him back in my mind. Yeah, keep an eye on him, man, dude. You actually kind of look like Eli Wolf. Dude. <laughs> I know he could be he could be a grumpy. I'm looking at him. He's like, he's describing like, him like jacked, and you know, I'm like, hey, Theo, sounds like you, man. Theo, really, Theo's really, looking really, at this dude. He's like my, he's my like, cousin Eli Wolf. Yeah, Theo's like this guy's kind of handsome. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> ruggishly handsome for sure. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Also, a couple things I want to hit real quick. First yeah, off. Uh, if you haven't hit that like button, please hit it. It's like super easy. We have the 19 people watching right now and or 21 watching Put right that, now. Kev Tompkins. Yeah, at nine likes. So, you know, hit, hit that like button. That helps us out. If you haven't hit the sc- subscribe button, hit the subscribe button. That helps us out a ton too. Um, you know, you don't have to actually listen to the podcast if you don't want to, but hit the subscribe button, even if you don't do anything else. Um, and also... Make sure you're following Andrew at Koopa Fiasco. It's right on the screen. So if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you're following him because I'll tell you what, this guy is going to help you out a ton, especially in the first few weeks of the regular season because he's going to get on Twitter and he's going to tell you, here's the tight ends you can drop. Here's the tight ends you should be picking up. He's going to he's gonna coach you right through this. It's going to be all right out there on Twitter. It's going to be for free. And your team is going to be better as a result of it. So just you know, take my take my two cent advice and do at least that. I appreciate you, but that's the thing, man. Is that like I respect your opinions, Dan. I respect like Howard. There's only a couple people who I like. I talk tight ends with, and honestly, I'll be like, "Oh, what do you think?" But like you guys, I care what you think because you guys are deep. You guys are actually doing these industry leagues. You're seeing yeah. what's out there. Like you, you're doing these deep dynasty leagues. You guys are leading the front on trades you know what i mean so like if you take you know my advice dan's advice and your own opinions first and foremost based on the things we talk about then then you're just going to be a better gamer and it's so much better to instead of giving people fish teach them to fish dude that's why i love shows like this because there's so many shows where it's four dudes like us and the podcast is what do you guys think about uh 
Deontay Johnson. I like him. I don't like him. I like him. And then you just move on to the next topic. Like, that's not helping anybody, dude. Let's talk about why I heard we like that these show. Guys. I think I heard that show today. And I, I <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I'm like, that's not helping anybody. Oh, do you, here's a list of guys I like. Dude, get out of here. I don't even do linear rankings. You look at my rankings on the on the page. It's five, the top five guys, which that could expand if I decide more guys are standalone worthy. And then after that, it's a pairing system. Because I don't think you should be looking at linear rankings. I think that's making you stupid. Right. Guys. Exactly. Yeah. Dan, it's time. It's time, man. It's time to talk Alberto. Come on, we'll we'll go to the next. You can get the next one. We got we got to talk Alberto. I want to know. I want to know where Andrew stands on him. I mean, it's a situation where again the offense a little different than Tanyan because it's probably not a narrow. You know, it, it, you know now with Patrick out of the out of the picture. A, the first question is: Do you think you know? Did he move up for you with Patrick out? And B, where are you on Albert? We see this this ascending offense with Russell Wilson coming in. You'd think that they they're going to score more points, get more offense going and and i think alberto is going to be a huge part of that just from the little bit that we've seen athletic wise and and you know there's everything catch radius the whole deal man what, what are your thoughts on on the big o i mean his profile is perfect for dynasty right like he's a quintessential dynasty play and if you draft him in dynasty talk about talk about the whole like draft roster talent and having it pay off as soon as po- humanly possible i mean like his value is up like they trade for a better quarterback, and in the trade, they trade away their starting tight end. Like, that's, like, something you make up for yourself. Like, when you're, you know what I mean? Like, what if they did this? It's like, dude, they're not going to do that. Then they they did it, right? Like, they did they did the thing. They did the exact thing. And he's got the crazy athletic profile. We're talking, like, I mean, who's more athletic than this guy? Vernon Davis? Or, I mean, like, way up there. 96. I don't have the player profile in front of me, but it's, like, 96%. No, he's he's right the up boards. there. Yeah. Across the boards, right? So, again... You know the window might not be there. He's but he's twenty three. What is it like? Twenty hundred percentile speed score. Hundy, hundy percentile, bro. Like he can't get it. Doesn't we can't go it. We can't pull over any further. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't the, get any higher. Is the better is the better dynasty play on his own team already? Would be my problem with with Albert Owen dynasty is is Dulcich a better dynasty play? Well, like right now. Well, that's just about the most annoying thing that could happen, right? Like they go out and draft this guy. And this is something that I that I I say when you're thinking about when you're trying to project scenarios, put yourself in the in the shoes of the coach, right? You're the coach of the Philadelphia Eagles two years ago, and you were you're looking around the tight end room and you say, Okay, we want to run a two tight end set. Who am I gonna have block and who am I gonna have play the slot? And even if Dallas Goddard in a vacuum is better at catching passes than Zach Ertz, he was so much better at blocking. Number two blocking tight end in the league. So he had to stay in line and the other guy had to go and play, got to play the slot, which is Zach Ertz, right? In this situation, I look at Albert O and he's like 6'6", 250. Dolce is like, what, 6'4", 245, more of a move tight end. That could be the problem here. And if they were planning on having Tim Patrick play that Alan Lazard, Alan Lazard played like 60 snaps at tight end last year. Like he was like a kind of pseudo blocking type guy. Like if they're gonna have Dul- Dulcich move into that role, then that would be problematic. So I like the guy in Dynasty long term. I like both of them in Dynasty. I have trouble with projecting them to be better than Judy and Sutton in terms of targets. I like him in best ball, both of them at ADP in best ball because Russell Wilson could throw one of us a touchdown. You know what I mean? Like you could. Ad- push a shopping cart down the field and also Wilch and could throw a touchdown. You know, Dan's been training. Dan's yeah. been tra- yeah. I mean, Dan, I mean, like that's what I'm saying. I'm like, if you gave him one of those like Velcro balls and just strapped me in Velcro, you could tie my hands by my back. You could stick a touchdown in my face. So it's like Russell Wilson's definitely going to throw touchdowns to these players. It's just a matter of when. So I don't know, man. It's what do you do? You, like what situation? I, I just, what situation? Like say you're in a normal person league. Like we're in crazy people leagues. Let's say you're a normal twelve team hometown league, like a normal person. In what situation are you drafting Albert O? Right. Well, I think the the bet the bet is that he's Denver's Julius Thomas. If you want to take a like a bullish a bullish thing, is he he profiles as a guy who's going to catch a lot of touchdowns. It's a very difficult thing to bet on touchdowns, but like he could be the Dawson Knox of this year. Um, that yes. costs a little more. I'm not necessarily making that bet. But I think that he's such an athlete. Um, Dulcich scares me a little bit. 
I mean, I think that Dulcich to me might be the biggest beneficiary of the the Tim Patrick news besides KJ Hamler because Dulcich was a former wide receiver at UCLA. Um, but like, I don't want to get shut out on Alberto, and I have drafted him a little bit, but it's it scares the hell out of me that there's a second tight end that they're, they're talking up, um, and I'd probably go in different directions, especially considering JD. Like, you could get Komet a round earlier than Alberto. They're like right in the similar wheelhouse as that. So that like kind of scares me a little bit in terms of safety. But if I'm trying to hit a home run, Alberto could have 10 touchdowns this year. He could, he could have a third touchdown a, a tar, a total. Right. And that's, and that's the problem is that that's how, that's how they fill out the back, the back end tight end ones. And at the end of the day, you look at it and you're like, Oh, he was tight end nine. You know, Hayden Hurst in 2020 was tight end nine. Oh, awesome. But then you look at the week-to-week basis, and you go back and remember, you couldn't actually start the guy in a regular league. So I'm with you. I think it could easily potentially happen, but more of a best ball play. Even Dawson Knox is kind of last year, like, you know. Yeah, touchdowns are a little bit fooky for him, you know. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. 100%. So, yeah. Uh, somebody in the chat says uh, Johnny wanted to stockpile. What's up with Johnny yeah, Smith? That's a great question, Stockpile. Yeah. So uh, anybody in the chat recognize this jersey? Knows that I'm a <laughs> I'm a Patriots I'm a Patriots fan. I got I got the tight end jerseys going on. And it, yeah, here you go. Anybody in the chat got this one with the stripes? Well, I, uh, I know because you told us in the in the chat. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, but dude, here's the here's the reality: is that these two tight ends do very different things. Hunter Henry is one of the best in the league at man to man. Like he truly is uh, 45% of his catches came versus man to man. He had nine touchdowns, mostly in zero coverage situations where he just beat his guy. He's bigger, fast, strong. He makes those plays. John Smith is a totally different player. He's great versus zone and in space. And I think he would have had a better year if he was healthy for the games where you could utilize that. So the big ones were the jet, the two jets games, the chargers game, these teams that play this cover two shell, like Robert Sala plays a cover two shell. And if you go back and, and, and look at the second game there, John who got the ball seven times within the first two drives and then he hurt his shoulder. But like, that was going to be a John game. There are going to be John games. He's going to sc- probably score. They got rid of the, the fullback, uh, Jakob Johnson. They're probably going to use him in that capacity in some degree. He's probably going to score two rushing touchdowns and he's going to have a 50 yard touchdown at some point and we're just never going to know in advance when it's going to happen you know what i mean so like the the pro like hunter henry is just so much more consistent and safe that i like him better but i think john was a good player and i think he's going to to be better this year than he was last year he's not bad he was just hurt and when he was healthy it was just not the right situation for that type of player and you know he's probably going to be martellus bennett in that offense when they had Martellus Bennett. And when they had Martellus Bennett, they won the Super Bowl. But, you know, it's just you use a guy to block and catch balls in space, it's tough to predict, you know. So that's my Johnny Smith take. I got them all. Famous Jay, cheers, brother. I appreciate you, man. There you go. Yeah. So um, <laughs> we never really did uh, did our promo exactly. JD, but uh, we we probably want to sneak one of those in before we get. Uh, yeah, I was we I was we I usually tr- kind of fit them in all at the end just because the content is. Uh, I don't I don't want to disturb Theo. Theo gets in a flow. You got your flow going. You're ten. You know, like I, you know, Coop's Coop's on a roll. He's just rocking the mic like it's like it's nothing. But let's uh, let's throw our friends up on the board. The FFPC guys, if you're not hooked up already, if you're not already registered up at my FFPC.com. A, I, I, I don't believe it because you're listening to us in the middle of uh, August right now or the summer. Um, but if you're not, we'll hook you up with a uh, sign-up bonus, $35 credit. That'll get you into right now a, a $35 Superflex 2 best ball tournament. What, what's the first prize, Dan, on the number two? Is it another ten grand, or did they up yeah. that? Yep, yep, same thing. Another it's Exactly 10. the same tournament. Nice. So you see it on the board. Email us, goatdistrict at gmail, at goatdistrict. Or tag any one of us on the screen, uh, Theo, Dan, or, or myself, and we'll uh, hook you guys up uh, with the sign-up bonus. They've got all kinds going on right now, guys. The main event, uh, you can play for a milli. You can play, uh, you know, you've got the, the Dynasty um, are popping, the Triflexes. You've got best ball tournaments, best ball slims, you know, smaller leagues, just 12-man leagues, regular leagues, if that's your thing. 
um, and a bunch of, of, of big tournaments. And you can sign up for Vegas right now too. They got some live spots left. So make sure you sign up for, for the Vegas uh, action going on. You'll see Dan and Theo down there for show. Guys, underdog. You know, I, I call this like the 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 fantasy football on crack. You know, F, FFPC, you're putting time in, you're you're doing your work, you're a little, you maybe you put more time in sculpting that roster. Underdog, man, FFPC on crap. You want to on crack? You want to win two million dollars? It's costing you what? What is it? Five bucks right now, guys, to win, to win two million dollars? It's unbelievable the tournaments they have on there. You combine the underdog and the FFPC, you're laughing. We'll hook you up with up to a hundred dollars match. Use the code District at Underdog Fantasy. On your phone, on your web browser, any way you like it, we're hooking you up. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Guys, who's left right now? I, I'll throw this in, Dan. Before I pass it, because, Dan, you've been really good at throwing in these uh, the promos because I've been slacking a bit. I'm, I'm, I'm mesmerized by Coop's tight end knowledge here. But we talked about one rookie tight end. I like using Dulcich. The other one is Trey McBride. Kind of late, late in drafts, you know, to balance out um your your tight end or your roster just because they they offer that upside how do you feel about the the rookie tight end in arizona well first i just want to give a quick shout out 1912 fantasy in the chat correctly identified the ben Coates jersey so shout out dude that's that's the one man that's that's my boy one of my favorites all time uh so if i were to create a fictional award the most likely to be this year's pat fryermuth award i would you'd have to give it a trey mcbride and the path being that you think that, uh, you know, Zach Ertz, you know, age kept, catches up to him. There's only been, at his age, there's only been two guys that have had 1,000-yard ceilings seasons. We're talking Travis Kelsey and, you know, some guy for the Eagles in the 60s, Pete Retzlaff. Like, it just doesn't happen, right? Like, not even in, not even um, Tony Gonzalez was, was dropping him. You know what I mean? So, um, like, that's, that's where he's at here, and that's what your – you're expecting either an injury to Ertz, like Ebron, like Ebron got hurt, and then they brought in Muth, and they said, you know what, we're just gonna roll with him. Like that's what you need to happen. But uh, you know, for long term in Dino, I, I like him because that offense, the air raid, is a it, at its heart is a four wide receiver set offense, and we want our tight ends playing wide receiver. We want wide we want wide receivers that we can start at tight end, right? Like that's that's the end goal. That's the perfect situation. So. Uh, we want eventually Trey McBride to become the starter and be a guy that plays slot in a four wide receiver set offense run by Kyler Murray. And that that's what could happen. That's so in Dino, I'm in, I'm in on McBride uh, analyzing tight ends from a skill perspective and from a scouting perspective. It's just not something that I'm, that I'm trying to do. It's just, it's such a difficult thing to do. I mean, think about how we got some of these guys, right? Like, George Kittle, were you realize? Were you really out there being like, oh yeah, George Kittle is going to be a star? The 49ers drafted George Kittle because they took C.J. Beathard in the third round and said, let's take the tight end that Beathard played with in college a couple rounds later. Like that's you know that's what happened. Like it's not this. It's such a difficult position to analyze. the The Ravens took Hayden Hurst first and then took Mark Andrews. Like you're going to bang your head against the wall trying to play that game. Just go for the guys that have the best physical profile. That's what I've been doing, you know? So, uh, Trey McBride fits the bill. He's got the skill. He got the draft capital. We like him. Yep. Yep. Exactly. I mean, typically the, you know, your tight ends are going to come out of the top four rounds, but yes, you know, there, there are enough outliers that, uh, you, you, you can't even necessarily stick with that. So, you know, but there, there's guys like Isaiah Likely. You know, you can look at him and you can go, no, no, right, not happening. Uh, you know, he's it's how crazy the of- position is. I just want to say real quick, like the best tight end that was drafted in 2014 wasn't even a tight end. It was a quarterback. It was Logan Thomas. And the next year, the best tight end from that draft class was a wide receiver. It was Darren Waller. It's like, what are we doing? It's just a crazy position. You know what I mean? It's so sorry to interrupt Dan, but it's just I, the whole <laughs> no, people come exactly to me right. and they're like, what tight end do you like from college? I don't know. I'm like, I don't know. Whoever's the fastest. It goes in the second round. I mean, like, come on. Plus, this is re- plus it's such a complicated position that it ta- usually takes him longer to kick in anyways. Like look at Njoku, man. How many years is he in the league? Now he's finally going to be a breakout candidate. You know what I mean? So yeah. you never yeah. know what you guys are going to pop too. John o, John who came to a new, new situation injury. He could easily blow up this year, you know, and be the Hunter Henry. 
It's crazy. Delaney Walker, like we said, seven years, 30 yeah. years old. That he was top five, three years in a row. There was yeah. Gary Barnage coming out of dude, some library somewhere. She's looking like a pen salesman. Yeah, it went right back to the same library the next year. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for stopping yeah. by, Gary. Yeah, that was that was the greatest one year wonder at the history of tight ends, I think. Yeah. Pretty good. And then uh yes, goes, yeah. yeah, the the Patriots had one way back when too. It was oh my god. I'm trying to think who it was. Daniel Graham. Uh oh, Ben Watson. Like they have or how far back yeah. are we talking? Maybe ben Watson. Uh, it would have been or it probably would have been nineties. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll have to think on that one. We'll have It'll to, come to me. Google for that one, Dan. Yeah. Russ Francis. So oh, man, there... <laughs> <laughs> before the 49ers it? stole him away. Yes. I'm sorry. No, I was just, I was just saying we're we're at a buck fifty, and as generous as you've been, uh, we appreciate all the goodness. Theo, is there is there anyone we haven't hit on that that's a must that we need to talk about, or or, or even Andrew? Is there someone that you know you've got in the back pocket that we didn't touch on yet? Maybe like a deep, 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 deep little Mo Ali Cox type of. Yeah, we got it. I mean, I I mean like we, we hit we hit everybody I want to hit on, but if you have anybody that we should be potentially like. A waiver wire guy for week one. Oh, we got a question. We got a question about the Giants tight ends. And anyone interests you? Perfect, dude. Because that's where I was gonna go, man. That's yeah. where I was gonna go. And like, we have to, you know, we're 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 this deep. We're this deep in the hustle. We might as well say every name that that is out there, right? So, for the, for the Giants, here's the situation. It's uh, Daniel Bellinger, the rookie, is actually kind of taking over that first spot, that first chair. Like, he's been the starter. Ricky Seals-Jones hasn't practiced in six practices, right? So for me, Daniel Bellinger, I'm not fully ready to commit to because Ricky Seals-Jones is one of those super annoying type players where it's, think about the Ertz and Goddard situation where he only catches passes. Ricky Seals-Jones does not block. Historically, looking at his numbers, he has been like an Anthony Ferkser, Cameron Brake type guy that only goes out there for pass plays and I don't necessarily think Ricky Seals Jones has the ceiling unless he's actually the full time starting tight end, but he could be just annoying enough to make it so that nobody is fantasy relevant. Right? That's the problem there. And it could be the problem as well with the uh with the Colts, where it's like Moelle Cox is probably the starter. Kylan Granson could play enough as the second tight end to be annoying. I talked to Jacob Sanderson, uh, a great analyst. I argue with him all the time, but he's a Colts fan. And he, in his opinion, Callan Granson is the guy you want to take a stab on. That's he could be like a, a little hot take in the, the FFPC streets, in my opinion. I don't know. I know. Well, the thing is, Mo, he's got a lot of things we like. Starter, basketball player. You know, I, I've seen a bunch of videos of him dunking. I mean, I've watched videos of Mike Kosecki playing volleyball. I'm deep into the tight ends. All right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I will say that. Live in those Instagram streets, right, uh, Andrew? Uh, you got it, dude. You got it. You got to see what's going on. The quick Who's clip. a better volleyball player, Alex Harris or Mike Gusecki? Mike Gusecki or Alex Yo, you can say he's nasty at volleyball, bro. I, I'll tell you right now, dude. Like, that's hot. I've, I watched a bunch of them. I'm like, damn. <laughs> so it, I also watch videos of Gusecki dunking. There's I, there's just videos of him just throwing down, man. It he is, came out. He was like that Cal Pitts of like you know 20 years ago now. Whenever Gusecki came out, yeah, he's like Kevin Love, bro. That's 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 what I'm talking about. But um, but uh, what were we even talking about before that? Um, Callan Granson, Molly yeah, Cox, Molly Cox. Yeah, yeah. So West, you know, he went to West Virginia. Great basketball player there, but. The problem is he blocked on more plays in general, including pass plays than any guy on the team, even more than Jack Doyle, who runs like a five flat, like flat line corpse 40 time, right? So like, and Mo Alleycox blocked more than him. And the coaches came out and said, it's going to be tough to replace the blocking of this player. And then they didn't quite do that. They drafted Jelani Woods, who has been falling behind even Drew Ogletree at camp. Hey, did you guys think we were going to get a Drew Ogletree shout out on this podcast? Or so Drew Ogletree, <laughs> Drew <laughs> finally, yeah, cross. Is he related is somebody, to Kevin Ogletree? Yeah, <laughs> might, might be. I say somebody out there just got bingo with the Drew the Drew Ogletree. Yeah, so Drew Ogletree, man, uh, he's apparently third on the Jeff Tart ahead of Johnny Woods. Um, so you know, it's kind of dicey there. Granson is the guy that I personally like better at, at, you know, if I'm taking a late round stab, but either one, 
like week one, we're going to get some answers and you might want to add one. It's just, it's so deep. It's so deep. Yeah, trying to get one of those guys. Open, open letter to NFL GMs and front offices who, when they have that, uh, you know, that really great two-way prospect at tight end, you know, that they've had on their roster for a year or two. And then inevitably it seems like they go out and draft a pass catching tight end instead of a blocking tight end. And this trend needs to reverse because I have kids to feed. Come on. (laughs) For real, for real, dude. It's like, you know, fill the, fill the room out. Like why can't a team go out and draft a a drew sample, you know, and then sleep easy at night, a Michael Pruitt or Anthony Auclair, you know, it's like, uh, people, you know, and sometimes I see people are like, Oh, they brought in Kyle Rudolph. I'm like, dude, trust me. Kyle Rudolph is not, He's not going to all of a sudden no. morph into this big problem. You know what I mean? Like, I still like Cameron Brate more than Kyle Rudolph, even though I don't like Cameron Brate that much. But, you know, so uh, that's that's about as deep as we get. I mean, you know, you could mention Kate Otten. If, yeah. like, you want situations where a guy could just blow the doors off, you know, but we haven't heard good things about Kate Otten. you got to listen to the camp stuff. I haven't heard much about him. I don't know. I'm not sure. But I've got me hearing good things about Daniel Belcher, but not Kate Otten. Yep. All right, guys. We've uh, we've combed the tight end desert. We've uh, we've gone deep into the tight end ocean. I mean, we've 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 gone. If, if there's anyone we haven't talked about that you want to talk about or, or that you think uh, should have been on the show, drop it in the comments. We appreciate you guys in the chat tonight. You guys are we're rock stars as usual. And our man Coop tonight was a rock star. Uh, tight end. I mean, where else are you gonna get tight end knowledge like this? Follow this man at Coop A Fiasco. Anything, uh, Coop, you want to give uh, the peeps anything you, you got coming or, or you want to remind them to check like your awesome tight end articles you just dropped or anything else, man, before we close this out? You know, that's it, man. I mean, if you follow me on Twitter, you get you get all of it because I retweet it all. I send it all out there, you know, and uh, just if you want the, the keys to the castle, read that one article. I know. You know, Theo, you retweeted it. Dan, you retweeted it. We'll, we'll retweet it, and I'll add the link into the comments uh, after the show as well. Perfect, yeah, because the bot, because the all, you know, it's a four-part series. The other three at the bottom are that one, man. And I just want to say, dude, thank you guys for having me on, man. It's always good to talk to people that, you know, because I do a lot of these, you know, like go on Sirius XM or whatever, and it's a different crowd, right? It's like you're talking to people doing the commute. They might have one fantasy league. It's I love talking to guys like you that are in these real – deep leagues right and and you're interested in the tight end fours because you've got to draft two or three or four you know what i mean so it's so much better to get an audience get in front of an audience like yours that's like sharp you guys are sharp gamers your audience is sharp gamers and you care about daniel bellinger you know what i mean so i love that man i love that you know what i mean evan ingram you guys want to talk I, like most people are just like i don't care about tight end 18 i'm like i care about tight end 40 bro let's <laughs> So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you guys. I care about tight end 60, bro. Who's drafting Michael Pruitt. Let's do it. You know? So like you guys, I appreciate you guys being the way you are and, and uh, you know, creating this audience and, and this vibe so that we can go on here and talk about deep tight ends for two straight hours. Cause that's what I like doing. We love it. We love it. Dan, I, Dan, I know you loved it. Like we said, you're, you're the tight end whisperer. Yeah. Uh, of the show i'm sure you enjoyed this uh, anything you want to uh, drop uh, before we close this bad boy out yeah just what i said before make sure you're you're following coop on uh, twitter because it's well worthwhile um <laughs> especially during those first few weeks of the season he's going to help you out a ton man uh you know and, and and he really does lay it all out there in his articles i mean if you want to get good at it you know there's a there's a lot of people out there on twitter and i've seen them who are just like you know all they want to do is nitpick and say well you're wrong bro and this is why and and but I, here's the thing, man. Coop's got the receipts, man. He's he's right almost all the time, uh, you know. And uh, he he's hardly ever missed. I don't even think you've ever missed with one of your uh, your quote unquote missed tight ends. Uh, you know, the hit tight ends are always a little bit harder. Um, you know, we always throw out a lot of different names, and uh, you know, we try we try to to increase your odds of actually hitting on a hit, but. You know, Andrew will really help you miss taking the misses, if that makes any sense. We bring you the best, Theo. That that's uh, that's what we do, right? We bring you the best, and and no better to, to talk tight end tonight. You you and Dan are are, are dropping a, a sweet epi tomorrow. So why don't you uh, let the people know about that and anything else we have coming up? 
Well, and it's actually Andrew and I. Andrew and I were in an Andrew, FFPC sorry, I apologize. My bad. Oh, no worries. Um, Andrew and I did an FFPC main event against a B bag Vitoba of first and 15, the two time uh, football guys uh, champion. Um, we're going to review that. It's going to be most likely tomorrow. Andrew and I are also going to do another um, half milli billies where we're going to draft a football guys team this week as well. So we're, we're figuring it out. We'll get it in, in Twitter. Uh, it's looking like tomorrow night for the for the main event review. Um, and then next week, we have some exciting guests coming on. We have Fantasy Mojo, uh, Darren Armani. Uh, he's coming in, in the district talking about ADP movers, some, some stacks that we should be looking at. Um, if anybody saw the previous time Fantasy Mojo was in the GOAT district, it was great. It's going to be awesome next week as well. Um, next week is also going to be the best fantasy football player probably on the planet. And Chad Schrader is going to be stepping back in the GOAT district. Um, returning for, I believe, the third time. Uh, we're, we're happy to have him. Uh, he was He's getting back to drafting uh, early this month. And uh, then it's looking like we're also going to have Jacob Sanderson on uh, next week at some some point. So we're uh, we're keeping the, the good shows going this summer. We're going to keep it going all the way till opening day. As the kids say, we're keeping it lit on the, on the channel. So make sure you subscribe. Guys, there's only... So we, you know, we're here to give you as much winning knowledge as we can. Anything we're we're asking ourselves in our in our little DM, we bring in the best that we know to help you guys out. And and ho hopefully you guys appreciate that. You can show your appreciation by smashing the subscribe, the like, whatever platform you listen to this, whether it's podcast, whether you watch us on YouTube, you watch us on Spotify. Just a little like is is uh, always appreciated. Helps us out. And uh, we appreciate you guys hanging out in the chat. Like I said, you guys are rocking tonight. You guys, uh, I know Coop brings in uh, the interactions and all the goodness. So we appreciate all the love. Uh, listener leagues will be dropping details. I'll drop that, uh, try to get that out by the weekend. We'll, we'll get the details figured out and we'll uh, let the participants know. I know you guys sent us uh, all your information. And uh, that's it, guys. We'll uh, we'll be back tomorrow night. I might do a ball in later on uh, this week or, or next week with uh, our boy Wheeler who was on last week, go check out uh, Friday night's uh, big 125 buy-in FFPC draft uh, best ball tournament for 200 grand. Theo was there. We dropped it with Wheeler. Um, and we had uh, Terp as well, uh, Dave Terp as well, another fa fantasy shark. So we appreciate you guys tonight. We'll check you all later and uh, have a good night. District, you know the Pope listens. Dynasty, our religion, for the blokes missing on all of these trades, on all of these plays, on all of these grades. By the end of the day, y'all getting played. So, what you gonna do next? Try to fill up that flex. Send the homie a text. That trash off is the best. You try to make it complex, then they text you back. Now all of a sudden, they don't make any sense. <laughs> Broaden your horizons, boy. Dynasty's not for the Simons, boy. These trades not for consignment, boy Respect your opponent, y'all some piranhas, boy This my advice, from me to you Open up your cute little podcast queue Search up G-O-A-T District, my dude Pop it in your ear, man, y'all know what to do It's the... And I always be traded And I always be traded And I always be traded Y'all try to betray them, but first you gotta bait them Fish Good times, fellas. Yeah, good. That was awesome. Good times, fellas. Yeah, it was good stuff. I did. You know what's crazy? Deep. Actually, my, my buddies are here at the house right now. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you one go. of my one of my buddies got divorced today, and oh, I was just still like, alive. I gotta, still alive. I was like, I got to. Oh, are we? Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. We, it's all right. it's. Fun.